Good evening, folks, and welcome to the June 16, 2021 meeting of the uh, Harbor and Coastal Zone Management Commission. Uh, if you are watching at home and you have any difficulty with your present connection, we are available in three ways. We're available on LMC TV. We're available through our YouTube streaming channel, which is listed on the uh, posted agenda, and we're and we're available on uh, the Zoom. Uh, the the, uh, the Zoom streaming uh, application through which we hold our teleconference. <clears throat> and if you are present at home and watching the meeting, uh, I thank you for taking an interest in village land use affairs. We have uh, a, a relatively compact agenda tonight. We have one applicant issue uh, and we have one non-applicant issue and we have um, a set of minutes that needs, uh, that needs adopted. Um, because we are waiting for one more commissioner who we hope will be joining us. Uh, let's turn to the minutes first. We had a, uh, the February 17 minutes. Um, and I think uh, I, I am often the person who has taken the longest to look at those. I think we can go ahead and um, I think we can go ahead and vote those. I'm ready to adopt them. Uh, so I will so move. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. And the uh, minutes of February 17 are adopted. We have, um, we can take an administrative item uh, while we're uh, waiting for uh, our last commissioner to join us as well. We have um, the, uh, the dock replacements in the harbor. Uh, we had previously been asked by the Department of State to uh, express any, um, any issue with the in-kind in-place replacement of several docks in the harbor. Uh, I think it was the view of the harbor master that it was a much needed replacement. Uh, and we expressed no opposition um, after uh, concluding that there was nothing that fell within our purview that we should, uh, that we should take issue with. Good evening, Lisa. Hi, everyone. <clears throat> Pardon my throat this evening. Hi. Um, however, uh, it's a re, an in-kind, in-place replacement of docks uh, has a has a threshold. I forget the dollar number, um, and hopefully T.J. Uh, Ruin, who's our counsel, can can remind me. But there is a dollar threshold for in-kind, in-place to fall below um, our permit authority uh, for marine structures, uh, even for an in-kind, in-place. Um, we have we are supposed to review and permit. Um, uh, projects over a certain size, and that makes a certain amount of sense, right? Because it, if something is in fact an in-kind, in-place replacement, we should be able to quickly determine that, and we should not be uh, prevented from determining something actually isn't uh, an in-kind, in-place replacement. Uh, no applicant could, for example, circumvent us by doing something that uh, was a marine structure and was not a, a proper replacement uh, simply by saying that it was. Uh, it's actually not proper for the village to do that either. So while we don't want to do anything to slow down their process, uh, our orderly running requires that they get a, an application in front of us. And I'm sure the harbor master will, will bring that uh, in front of us in due course. Uh, but Amber, if you could please let the... Um, the harbor master know that um, because of the size of the project, uh, we still need to do a um, still need to do a permit review and issue a marine structures permit for the dock replacement, and we'll take that up as quickly and expeditiously as we're able. And uh, chair, that was uh, the threshold is twenty thousand dollars. Twenty. I had fifteen in my head, and I didn't want to say it and be wrong. Thank you. So right over a twenty thousand dollar threshold, we don't simply assume that it's in kind in place. We actually look at it, and and while I'm uh, while I'm sure that this is an important and much needed uh, replacement, and we're not slowing it down, um, we we just do need to cross all our t's and dot all our i's. That is our only administrative item for the evening, and we have a single applicant item on. Eleven sixty five uh, Grecian is on again. Uh, we have, after, uh, after several adjournments uh, in order to get some, some uh, paperwork that the applicant believed concluded the file, uh, I believe they are ready and we should bring them up. Good 
Good evening, Chairman Burke. Can you all hear me okay? Yes, ma'am. Good to hear your voice again, Ms. Motel. Ah, Good and I can see your you face. All. There you are. Great. Good to see you all. Uh, for the record, Kristen Motel with the law firm Cuddy and Fader on behalf of the applicants, Bill and Elizabeth Fedina. Um, Bill and Elizabeth are here tonight along with my colleague, Anthony Geoffrey, um, and Jim Ryan and Rich Cordone from JMC. They are the project engineers. We're also joined by Beth Evans, who is our wetlands and environmental consultant. We have uh, Leonard Jackson, who is our flood control, coastal consultant, hydrology and stormwater design expert. And um, before I go any further, I see, um, I thought I saw Andrew Maggio earlier. Oh, okay, there we go. I was going to ask chairman, is the commission considering reducing their uh, number of commissioners from seven down to five permanently or? We, are, we have recommended no such thing. Okay. Um, we are, uh, so, I mean, I guess the, the appointment of commissioners is all public business. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so I guess I can tell you that it, it, it is simply uh, beyond our control to get more commissioners. The trustees have to appoint them. And right now we are without them. I would like to have them and we do not. Okay. All right. So to, to clarify for the commission to take action on, on projects, um, I believe it would require a, a vote of four commissioners because it is a seven member board. Correct. That, that is, that is my understanding. We've sometimes been in that position because of uh, recusals and other times because the, uh, the commission is temporarily short staffed. We have been, um, we got very short staffed with, uh, with several uh, legacy members rotating off. Some have been replaced. Um, uh, Mr. Cellular and Ms. Achisa are, are new even during the life of this application. And um, I would expect that at some time, hopefully in the near future, we will have uh, two more commissioners and return to our full strength. Right now, that's not where we are. Okay, thank you. Um, at this time, the, the applicants have prepared a brief presentation, and I would respectfully request that they be given the opportunity to um, address the commission, if that's all right with you, Chairman. Of course. Okay. Um, Amber, I believe um, Bill Fadina has been elevated to panelist, and Rich Cordone is going to share his screen for this presentation. Bill, I'll turn it over to you if you're there. I am Kristen, and good evening, Commissioners. Um, would it be possible if Rich Cordone, wonderful, started staring at screen? Great. Well, commissioners, it's, it's nice, truly nice to be back. Uh, there are many times over the last three months we would have liked to be here. But as Commissioner Burt, as you mentioned, we kind of wanted to complete the file um, for all, all sort of non-planning you know, board HCZMC approvals. We wanted to get everything sort of set to complete the file. And so uh, come by today, Commissioners Burt, O'Rourke, and Maggio, it's nice to talk with you again. Commissioners uh, Axia and Celier, it's, again, nice to meet you. Uh, we've been in front of the, commission, the committee for about a year, uh, though with the last three to four months accepted. And we wanted to put together in the September, November meetings, um, my wife and I did sort of like a five to 10 minute recap. And those were sort of from the last meeting, what we've changed to sort of work with the commission. And so since it's been a few months, we're not going to necessarily review the whole project, just really the, the sort of the key issues that have been looked at for the last two meetings and sort of what we've done since then. So again, just a few pages and hopefully five or 10 minutes to uh, set the scene in terms of what we're requesting tonight. And hopefully uh, we can find some resolution, which would be very much appreciated. Um, Rich, would you mind going on the recap page? So basically, hopefully everyone can see this on your screens. I mean, I, I sort of said it has been five months since our last meeting. And the delay really was because we were waiting for the Westchester Department of Health's approval on the proposed septic system. And I think every, all of us would recognize and probably agree with the health department that they prioritized the COVID-19 vaccine rollout in the county. So um, we went many, many weeks and months of ranging from asking to begging for approval. And they just said, look, frankly, it prioritized. And obviously we understand that. So that was the biggest reason for the delay. So again, thank you for your patience. Uh, the, the second page, which we'll go in a second, is really uh, lists the approvals and reviews that have been required by state and, of course, the non-village local agencies uh, that we to completing the record. Um, as a reminder to the new uh, old and sort of new commissioners, from July to November, the first few meetings, 
admittedly, it was a learning process for us, and we went through a lot of attributes on the application, and we sort of sort of optimized the site to try to satisfy a number of things. But in reality, July to November, we did a significant redesign, truly to try to adhere to the consistency requirements of the of the, of the LWRP. And really, at the end of that, so November, January, and even throughout the September meetings, we the, the presence of positive net fill on the site uh, it sort of caused a lot of brainstorming, questioning, and sort of a, was a, a, a sort of a key discussion point. And I think at the bottom of this page, I just wanted to sort of recap, I'd say two points that hopefully point to the uniqueness of this application. And the first, which we really investigated in January after Lanny Jackson's report, was that this site, unlike even my neighbors across the street, uh, we're in an AE10 title zone. Those are VE. And so I know we, we can obviously discuss this in at length again, but we sort of uh, in the January meeting in AE10, you know, the 420 cubic yards of fill because we're not in a high velocity uh, tidal flood zone, which is VE, and because the location of our site on an inlet, which is attached to Long Island Sound, you know, we, we obviously Lenny Jackson's report saying there's no measurable impact um, given this very specific site and location. And then the, the second one, which uh, came up in November is from the, the site plans in November has had all the numbers, but really the septic system, if we did nothing, if we were not applying to any sort of renovation on the site and the septic system, if we just repaired it, which hasn't been repaired in 70 years and has been failing for the last four years, um, and we haven't used it admittedly in the last three years since we own the house, the, that would require per the WCDOH codes and the fill requirements, the 680 cubic yards of fill. So again, after it took us many months to November to get to the revised, the current proposal, but we're proposing 420 cubic yards of positive net fill. So again, this is more of a, those numbers are on the November submissions, but this is a reminder, hopefully, of the uniqueness of these key points in the application. And that's a sort of step one. And the next few pages, uh, give a little more details on each of these points. If Rich, you want to go to the second, uh, the next page, which is really a summary of the approvals that and the dates that we've reached those approvals. And so you can see the West Chester Department of Health on May 25th. Uh, they really their key role was to approve uh, the septic system as proposed. The village engineer in their capacity was solely relating to stormwater. Uh, that, that was their last memo on May 18th. The DEC back in November for, uh, issued the title wetlands permit and the Marinette Building Inspector solely linked to the zoning compliance back in November. And I guess it's obviously worth pointing out that anything we do from a construction development will have to be consistent, or excuse me, in compliance with the Village Floodplain Development Code and FEMA's construction standards. And lastly, we got these early on in our application process last year. The SHPO, sort of historical landmark, they confirmed, you know, there's nothing here of that status. And of course, the Army Corps said there's a letter of no jurisdiction. Rich, next page, please. Which is again, just recapping why we waited really for the Department of Health. You can see the timeline there. So this one and the following page shows it on the site plan, uh, which we the following page was uh, on the November summer we did. But really this was showing to show a lot of the redesign work we did, taking into a lot of feedback and hopefully achieving consistency with the LWRP policies. But so I will, I can read these, but Rich, would you just go to the next page? And in the interest of time, if we show the site plan, I can sort of read the, the page before for that. So you can see uh, the change in impervious, we didn't change any impervious from the existing conditions to the new proposal. Of course, you can sort of see from July to the September site plans to the current one proposed in November, you can see the drastic change. You can, I mean, if you keep going down, you have the fill proposed on, all the way on the left, was just over a thousand cubic yards to 420 cubic yards on the right. The house and garage, you can see they move farther from the water and the wetlands, but said in a different way, the garage was 100% in the wetland buffer before, and it's now 50% out of it. And the driveway was 80% in the wetland buffer before, and now it's 100% even out of the wetland buffer. Of course, that helps with impervious, but again, these considerations were taken into mind. Um, we removed the walkway between the house and the garage. We increased the deck, which is pervious, we even had updated landscaping wetlands plan uh, as well. So again, that's these were the massive designs from that sort of summer session to the current November one. And so the next two slides, Richard, go to the next one. This is just another way of showing kind of how the house fits in with the surrounding neighbors. And so I know we've been sort of saying, you know, the given the septic, the actually has a four-bedroom house. What we're proposing 
is a the furthest house from you know the, the water's edge or high water line compared to any and all of my neighbors it's the smallest house in square foot um, and bedrooms of all the neighbors you can kind of see the aerial view so I guess what we're trying to say we've been designing just a house that we want to live and we've been really hoping we could find you know working consistency with uh, the commission so uh, the next page is really again these are meant to be shorter summary pages and there's only two more after this uh, where we can get to our uh, fulsome discussion but so you can sort of see the existing verse proposed. Uh, these are a selection of numbers from really the last three site, site plans proposed. You know, so the house was built in 1953, never been updated. It's going from a three bed to four bed, from a one car to two car garage. You know, the impervious is staying the same. Obviously, are we, is there any fill or positive net fill in the wetland buffer or proffer? No, obviously outside of the wetland, yes. Uh, we're proposing 420 cubic yards. But again, sort of that, that key unique point, if we did nothing and just had to renovate the septic in accordance with WCDOA's code, we'd have to have 680 cubic yards of fill. And so uh, again, that's so again, these are the, the key points. There's obviously met many more we can talk through. Um, and then the, if Rich, the last, sort of the next two and really last two pages are a summary uh, of the impact from the fill and actually some of the numbers just to again, show you exactly what they are. And so the first page here, the, the impact from the fill, we absolutely understand the fill is a very main concern. And so we sort of, we've been redesigning the house in mind with that. And so we're just repeating a bit of things I said at the introduction about Grecian Point Road, number 1165, being in the AE10 tidal flood zone, VE tidal flood zone, and of course experts can discuss, but the, you know, the difference with AE and VE is really the AEs don't have the additional hazards due to storm induced velocity i.e. are we on Long Island Sound with waves hitting it or no? The answer is no. We're in the back of an inlet cove with a very low velocity increase or decrease in tidal activity. And so the, la the last two uh, points on the page, basically uh, Lenny Jackson said there's no real measurable impact on the site. And sort of obviously the major consulting memo didn't really opine too much on it about dissenting Lenny Jackson. We can obviously discuss that tonight. But, um, and the very, the very next page is just the numbers to show you how we've really been trying to take into consideration everything we've discussed over the last year with the HCCMC committee here. And so by redesigning the house, really what we tried to do is eliminate kind of any fill from anything but the septic system. That was, that was the goal. Um, and so you can sort of see the progression uh, and analysis from when we, from July to September to November, uh, obviously we had 1600 cubic yards and uh, Seamus, I remember, you know, have you, have you optimized it more? Have you really looked? And we really, through September, we took the existing three car garage, the existing plot and said, this is the best we can do uh, with sort of the existing house and, and layout of the, call it the house and garage and everything we wanted. And then from November, we said, look, we just really want to live here. We really want to develop. We really want to be consistent. So we knocked out a lot of things. We moved, detached the garage, made a two car garage. We got rid of the walkway. We moved the house as far as, as, far as we could towards the road. Um, the septic was a limiting factor on that as well. And so you can sort of see the resulting 420 cubic yards of fill versus again, uh, the existing septic system. And there's obviously we're happy to discuss any and all parts of the application. I wanted to go right to the main point that we left off uh, last time and Rich you can go to the next page. Um, and so I, I guess, Maybe Kristen or Commissioner Burt, I'm happy to keep talking, but really I can turn it back to you. And just, again, I'd like to finish with saying, look, we, we really do appreciate the time you spent on it. Um, and myself listening to many of the pr prior meetings online after we, you know, you dedicate a lot of time on the Wednesday meetings and before. So look, I'll just say thank you there and hope we can find a resolution. So appreciate it. Thank you, Ms. Ms. Motel. I want to give you a, a chance to I want to give you a chance to say everything you want to say before before you have to face the hot bench. Thank you, Chairman. I, I think we're ready to take questions from the commissioners. We do have our, our full panel here. Um, and I know or I believe that Mazer Consulting is also here to um, entertain questions from the commission um, as well as uh, addressing the applicant. And we would request that we have the opportunity to um, address Mazer as well at that time. Well, that, <clears throat> since you mentioned it, this is the first time we've uh, we've had the benefit of our uh, our consultants from, from Mazer here with us for a meeting. This has been uh, this has been kicked over uh, a number of times for reasons that we've discussed. Um, so, uh, Mr. Uh, Hippolyte, um, I'm 
meeting you for the first time on this uh, on this meeting here. I wanted to um, address some questions to you first, if I could. Great. No um, so, is there any history of leaks or or breaks in existing uh, sewer lines caused by construction that could uh, that that should lead us to worry that the installation of a private sewer line here would do more harm than good? So we, you know, we made a site visit. We talked to the village engineer. Um, based on our look out there, there's no evidence of that. And the town didn't have any evidence of that. So I would say no. You asked the town for, uh, did you ask the town for, for a, uh, their, their institutional recollection about that? Yeah, we called the village engineer. It's a long time ago now, but we called them and asked them if they had any history or record of breaks and they did not have any. Okay, thank you. And um, there's a, there was a, a specific response to a particular point on this issue in uh, response number two on page um, three of JMC's um, February 24, 2021 letter. Do you have that available to you? I do. Um, all right, I, I wanted to see if I could get you to, to take a look at their response number two that responds to your comment number two carrying over from page uh, two to three uh, because I wanted to give, uh, I wanted to hear what you had to say in response to that. Um, so we've looked at the flood elevation of the site versus the elevation of the structure versus the elevation of the system. Um, they're saying there's a base flood elevation of 13, which we agree. The system is going to be at the top of the system is going to be at 15 or, or possibly 15.5 with the remaining parts of the system below below grade. So it's going to be it's going to be below the flood hazard grade. So at some points, potentially that entire system can be inundated by flood orders. How low can we expect the uh, how low could we expect uh, septic waste to go? In, in flood elevation terms uh, during the life of the proposed system? So septics are, are an interesting case. It depends on maintenance. So the better the maintenance, the better um, the effluent leaving the system gets clean going down below. The less the maintenance, the worse it is. So the more soaps, the more detergents, the more household products you institute in your system, the less you clean your septic tank, because over time people forget about septic, it's out of mind, not of waste. The more that leaches in the system, it clogs it, and then it becomes a mat, and then it will integrate. So you have flood waters that two would integrate. If they take care of it, the effluent will go down the first four feet. Eventually, it's going to hit an impermeable clay barrier, which they have, and it'll run along the barrier and just go into the groundwaters of that area. Okay. So, uh, so what's the what's the elevation of the impermeable clay? Is, which is what, what I was really asking. I think it's around elevation eight. I don't, I don't see it on the detail, but I'm believing it's about that depth. All yeah. right, because I, I thought I understood eight and a half. Yeah, I think it's eight and a half. And I, I wanted to make sure that I, I wasn't misunderstanding that. Yeah. Okay, so will a, a properly constructed private sewer line here uh, release any organic waste into the environment? No, it will release none. In uh, paragraph five of your report, uh, you opined on the adverse impact on, on surface water and groundwater. Um, it would be useful to me if you could, that's, that's, a, that's a dense sentence. It would be useful to me if you, could, if you could unpack that. What is, in your view, the adverse impact to the surface and groundwater? So again, a septic system is made take your your fluent take the solids out run it through a we'll call it a cleansing barrier for lack of a better term and then discharge it to groundwater 
as long as surface water or flood doesn't inundate it, it should go into the groundwater. The groundwater in that area, because of the nature of where it is, is probably relatively high. So it will hit it at, at a high elevation. If the system is maintained properly and has no issues, the effect on groundwater environmentally would be minimal. But as the existing site shows, they have a failing septic system. So at some point over its time, they didn't take care of it. Or they use detergents or soaps, which everybody uses. They did laundry, which everybody uses. And the systems ultimately fail. Once they fail, there's no cleansing of the effluent. It's a direct discharge to the groundwater. How do you determine in advance how long it's going to take for a septic tank to fail? It depends. Well, well, I said tank. I didn't mean tank for a septic system to fail. It depends on the homeowner. It literally depends on number of loads of wash, how many showers they take, how much detergent they use, whether they use a environmentally friendly detergent or a non-environmentally friendly detergent. How many detergents they use, such as Windex or things of that nature, all that plays into a septic system and its ultimate failure rate. I've seen systems last for years in the, in the highlands of very sandy soils where they're not influenced by groundwater and it's very coarse, they will last a lot longer. And that's specifically where the groundwater is deeper. So the groundwater can be 10 or 15 feet below the system. When the groundwater is higher and you're installing clay barriers, the possibility of that system failing is a lot more likely. Um, <clears throat> what is the seasonal high groundwater at the at the site of the uh, stormwater detention? I don't. They didn't. As far as I know, they didn't provide that. Okay. Now I read something. I, I'm going to ask you to refer, if you can find it, to the JMC uh, letter of February 24 again. Yeah. Uh, in their um, number eight response, uh, I read that the that the groundwater detention was sealed, and I remember a prior discussion about this. And I I am I I confess that I am left somewhat confused. When the water goes into the detention system, what happens to it? Same thing, the detention system that we see on the plans will infiltrate into the groundwater. Let's give an infiltration system. Excuse me. Can... So I, what I'm gonna do is, uh, I, I, Mr. Cordon, I don't know if, the, if that was just your, uh, your mute being off or, or if you wanted to interject, I'm, uh, I'm going to uh, finish what I want to ask Mr. Uh, Hippolyte, and then uh, I think we're, uh, we're going to have a chance this evening for everybody to say what they've got to say, including responding to things he said. I, I apologize. That wasn't directed towards the board. Sorry about that. Okay. <laughs> We've all done that. <laughs> um, uh, well, oh, so... All right. So as I understand it, I, I thought I understood that right. The, the detention facility isn't, isn't sealed in the sense of permanently. It just infiltrates very, exfiltrates from the tank very slowly. Right. Okay. Uh, it, it, I probably should know the rate from my reading, but I don't recall it. Do you? Do you? No, no, they, they didn't provide a rate because they don't have it. You know, that I know of, again, they don't have any test holes for that system, so they don't have a rate. Okay, but I but I don't I don't mean the percolation rate into the soil. I mean the the exfiltration rate out of the the quote unquote sealed uh, holding tank. I mean I don't I don't have that rate, so I didn't, yeah. I didn't get the detention system calculations. Okay, uh, I, I guess this is probably a good time to ask John Kellard. Having reviewed the stormwater system, can you provide me some clarity on that? Yes, it's it's actually restricted by the outlet size of the pipe. I don't have the document right in front of me, uh, but it's, it's, it's regulated by the limit of the outflow to the pipe size. Right, they, they, on the plan you're showing a three and four inch, uh, three inch orifice, a four inch weir, and then eventually a 12 inch pipe that takes it away. Right, so the, so the three inch orifice controls the outflow. So it's equivalent to a, a three inch opening. Uh, uh, okay. When the system fills up so it doesn't back up, it'll crest the four, the weir above it. And this, trying, uh, that design was through the, through the design storm. Right, so they're trying to force it to infiltration, not to limit the outflow out of the structure. 
Yeah, the, 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 the design was based solely, as I understand it, Esteban did the review in the, and provided the comments. Um, it's, it's no infiltration was factored into the uh, volume of storage provided. It was purely a, uh, a storage, uh, uh, all, all, the, all the detention is provided in a, in a storage volume and not using infiltration to supplement some of that volume. Right, they haven't calculated in for any, any infiltration, but, the, but there is infiltration at some rate, right? Well, they're proposing an impervious barrier. They're encapsulating the, uh, the storage unit uh, in an impervious, with an impervious barrier so it does not infiltrate into the soil. So if it doesn't hit the three inch pipe, it, it just sits indefinitely? No, the three inch pipe is, is within, a, within a manhole structure, which is controlling the outflow. So there's a there's a pipe discharging from the storage unit that backs up uh, because it, uh, because let's say it's a it's an eight inch pipe coming out of the unit but you only have a three inch opening so it backs up into the storage unit right okay. and it's regulated on what what can actually discharge until the system is completely full then it would crest and then the, it would back up unit. okay. I, I now understand that. That is, that is very useful and, and that, that resolves my confusion on that issue. Okay, uh, I've run through the questions that I knew I had coming in. Um, so I think uh, I'm looking at Seamus who usually has his questions ready. <laughs> uh, so I, I think I'm gonna pass the mic to Commissioner O'Rourke. Sure, thanks. Um, so um, Andrew, I have a couple questions. Um, I think, um, although that discussion covered some perhaps. So um, first, do you, so in JMC's response letter to your guys' memo, um, just wanted to confirm that you agree with a statement that they made. So they characterized it that all partners, uh, sorry, all parties except that 460 cubic yards of fill will have no impact on the coastal area. Do, do you agree with that statement? This is, um... You know, there's a there's a factor of what is no impact and what is impact. So in, in your board's purview, you look at a cubic yard of fill as having an impact. It has impact. It's taking up flood storage. You might be in a non-velocity area, but you're still providing fill in an area that is affected by flooding. So for instance, if I provide 460 cubic yards of fill, that's more additional fill. If I have a flood, Somewhere else, there's 460 cubic yards of water that's affecting somebody. So it doesn't have no impact. They can argue that the impact is minimal and it's hard to tell where that impact is, but if they can't say it has no impact, it has impact. Yeah, I think um, as I understand it and um, just intuitively, and then I'll ask you to comment on it because it won't be all that articulate. Uh, Long Island Sound is enormous. It's basically part of the Atlantic Ocean. So a little fill doesn't change like the level of, the, of that. But, could you just speak a little bit more to that? So if you put some fill on your property, is there a potential micro impact somewhere nearby a neighbor or somewhere that's gonna have a little more water than they would have uh, flooding wise? Somebody has to get in somewhere. Okay. Okay, so then um, materiality would be the discussion perhaps there, but I guess what I'm hearing from you, from you is that their statement that everyone agrees that there's no impact on the coastal area is not exactly right. Right, so think about it. I mean, water, water has its own level. 480 cubic yards of fill might increase the water surface elevation and sound by some number we can't even calculate because it's so small. Mm -hmm. They're gonna fill on their property. So that means their area, their new island they create pushes more water to the sides. So now they're dry, somebody else is not dry or somebody else is less dry because it's forcing more water as it flows through to go on somebody else's property. It's not taking up their space. It can't say it has no impact, it has an impact. And then uh, maybe practically, and uh, I'll leave it to you on how you'd like to answer this, if at all, but practically, would a neighbor be concerned about 400 cubic yards, 4,000, 400,000? At what level do you think that, you know, it's moving um, water somewhere that would be, uh, you know, of some note or potential concern? 
If I was a neighbor, my concern would be when I look at their plan, is their area of fill pushing more water to my to my sideline? So is there going to be now water, even though it's low velocity, flowing in and out between our properties more on my side than on their side? The higher they make it, the wider they make it, the more effect it has either side. Because the water has to come up and then recede. So as it recedes, it's going to go back down and cause whatever erosion or damage it causes as it recedes. Okay. Thank you. I'm sure there'll be responses to some of these. I'll just keep going through my couple of questions uh, and then pass it along. Um, uh, this one we, we, we covered. Um, there's some discussion of mounding analysis, which, which I don't know anything about. Um, there's a reference uh, somewhere, and unfortunately I don't know where, that um, a, a, a below maybe 5,000 gallons, the Westchester County doesn't even consider mounding, and I think this is 800 gallons. Um, is the mounding of the septic system something that you can comment on, on how, how we should think about it in, you know, kind of a sensitive environmental area, uh, both known and so on? So I can for this board, the, the, obviously the Department of Health already approved the system, so they did their review. For this board, I get your concern is the difference between our pollutants going to reach at some point, the groundwaters or surface waters versus a septic system versus a sanitary sewer. In a sanitary sewer, none reach it, ever. If there's a break, they have to fix it immediately and most likely clean it up and none reaches it. In a septic, a mounting analysis provides the hydraulic loading between where it enters the pipes and then heads out in some cone or some degree of angle, let's say 45 degrees, and shows what effect it has on the ground as the groundwater comes up and down and then hits that level influences and takes that water away with it in the groundwater. If surface waters come in and inundate the system, potentially if the mounting analysis usurps that barrier, they're creating because the system fails, then it's taken in the way you wouldn't even know. You have no way of knowing that it's affecting it. If you go to lake and river communities all over the state, what's one of the biggest problems that faces lake and, and river communities upstate where there's no sewers? Septics failing and flooding the area with nutrients, which are poor nutrients or nitrogen. And those nitrogen cause weed growth and growth of lily pads and phragmites and all kinds of stuff because you don't know it's failing, it's under the ground. And the mounting analysis kind of throws into that. I mean, I, I, and I know the regulations are not required by the health department, but it throws in what the area is gonna be affected and how that effect can potentially be. Okay, that that's really, really helpful. So then, you know, I, I, I take no issue with Westchester County deciding they're not looking at anything below a certain amount of gallons just to just to regulate the county. But um, for us, our community, right on Delancey Cove, do you have an opinion on the mounding because you've been able to review it? Is there information on the mounding here? Can you? Well, they, they, no, they didn't provide it, so I don't have it. Um, so there's no there's no way to give an opinion on it. Just if I was, if my argument was a septic is better than a sanitary sewer, one way to prove it would be with mounting. I'll be one way to prove the argument. Okay. Thank you. Um, I think I have two more. Um, next question. Um, do, do you have any way to comment on whether there would be a path to get to net zero fill with a septic system at this site? I don't, I don't believe there is. Okay. I, don't, I, don't, I know they've testified to uh, with the number now. A repair would be 680 versus a new system at 420. That doesn't make any sense to me. Just take the old system out, put the new one in there. Doesn't, doesn't make any sense. So I, I don't I don't understand the argument. Maybe they could explain that. Yeah. I was gonna ask them later to explain that because I had the same sort of question. But 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 you do you do not think that you're getting a septic system here that would meet code without fill. Is that what I'm hearing from you? Right. Yeah, because the floodplain is at 13, the top of the system is at over 15. Okay, and then this is my last um, question, um, and I don't know, uh, it might be helpful to hear how um, comfortable you feel uh, responding to more of environmental issues, but if you look at our policy 7A, which no need to look at it, I'm going to quote from it, uh, there's specific areas in the village, um, you know, as, as as identified as real important wildlife habitats, it includes Delancey Cove, that's number one on the list, and nearby Gratian Point, Gratian Point Marsh. Um, so just thinking about um, septic runoff, I think, is where I'm focused. Um, do, do you have any thoughts on 
what they've proposed uh, having impacts on, and there's a list here. So this is related to wildlife, you know, circulation, flushing rates, tidal amplitude, uh, turbidity, water temperature, depth, morphology, substrate type, vegetation, structure, erosion, and sedimentation rates, as well as uh, the third section, which is chemical parameters such as dissolved oxygen, carbon dioxide, pH, dissolved solids, nutrients, organics, salinity, and pollutants. So failing septic system does all of those. So a system that's failing will do everything you just mentioned. Again, septic systems in on very large lots, five, six acres up in the woods, out of the groundwater areas, not in floodplains. They last forever. And if people are diligent taking care of the septic tank and pumping it, you'll have no problems. But the more you get, when they get in floodplain areas or wetland areas or, or areas where you need fill, the system becomes a lot more crucial to maintain it properly. And it becomes a burden on the homeowner. They're probably pumping their septic tank out on a 3,000 square foot house three to four times a year at three to four thousand dollars per pump. They have to have the bed inspected, people probe it. It takes a lot of work and a lot of money. Five years down the line, people don't like you spending 20 grand a year to take care of the septic system. You know, they don't. People they fail all over the place. That's what happens. And the sad part is, and I keep saying it, is the biggest failure of systems is soaps and detergents. That, all right, that's that's real helpful because that's a I think a data point that we didn't have on the record yet. So your view would be to maintain the septic, it's three to four pumps per year, perhaps if they're if a family's living there full time and that's expensive and that it's thousands of dollars per per time, right? Um, how about this though? A, if this septic system was properly maintained, um, did I hear the discussion right initially uh, with with Thomas and also the list that I just read out? A properly maintained septic system is not going to have any material issues. Is that is that your view? A properly maintained septic system. Or I, I should say this, this. Sorry to interrupt, but this properly, this this designed uh, and and maintained septic system. Right. So by the by the pure nature of the health department approving it, they're agreeing that a properly maintained system will have no problems. I still struggle with the floodplain elevation versus the invert elevation in the system. So the system discharges below the floodplain. Um, there are communities, you're not one of them, that require that to be above that. So you, you have time before the before the inverted system hits the groundwater. It, again, I'm not your health department. We, we like to see from the inverted system to groundwater at least four feet. In this case, I'm, it's probably impossible. You probably can't get it. So the, the oxygen depleted sewage effluent is going to hit that groundwater faster. I'm not saying that it wasn't approved by the health department, but it's not the best thing for your environment. Thank you. I don't have any other questions, but I found that very helpful. Thank you. You're welcome. Andrew? Yes. You're referring to me, Thomas? Oh. Yes. I, I yes. think you're up next for questions. Um, what uh, what type of water quality, uh, in terms of the storm water, what, what's be in this current design? What's done for water quality? We understand the quantity aspect. What's done for water quality? So I assume again, I think John reviewed it, but the stormwater detention system is taking the impervious areas, the driveway, or at least part of the driveway, the garage and the house. It's taking it, holding it for some period of time and discharging it. If it's truly being discharged with no infiltration, there's nothing being done for water quality other than I think they may have a treatment system in front of it. It looks like they do. So maybe they're, they're removing some of the oils, they get off a car. I, I, I didn't review that. Yeah, they have a, they have a uh, oh, rainwater harvesting tank for pretreatment. Which and is okay. And use for irrigation. And that'll give you the pretreatment with the settling of solids. Which Thank also you. maintenance. We maintain that also. Yes. Those are my questions. Thank you. And Lisa. Hi, thank you. Could you talk a, a little bit about uh, the water quality again? 
I, I was having just a little trouble hearing you. You want to do that, John? Oh, do you, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Uh, the water quality is a, is a pre-treatment process that's before the storage tank. It's, it's referred to as a rainwater harvesting tank. Uh, and your, flow, your storm flows from your roof and your driveway will first discharge into the pretreatment tank uh, where you will find that you will have settling of sediments, which typically carry uh, the majority of your pollutants to the bottom of the tank. Uh, the water will then sit in that tank until it, until it overflows into the, the storage unit where you'll, you'll obtain your, your detention uh, of, uh, mitigation of the stormwater. Uh, they'll also use the pretreatment water for irrigation purposes on the site. So there will be reuse of that uh, water that's typically, and it, it, you, the tank is always full except for the use of the irrigation water. So that'll provide some additional storage and settling time when, they, when the uh, rainwater harvest, when the water is used for irrigation. Okay, thank you. That's it. Um, Chairman Burt, would you mind if I added on to that? I had a related question. I was just kind of going with Mazer, but we're on the topic here of tailored session items, perhaps. Yeah, go ahead, absolutely. Yeah, so so um, are those retention, John, are those retention tanks that you're talking about, would, th would those be referred to as cisterns ever? Um, they are when they're used as an infiltration practice. But because of the groundwater elevation in the soils, which you don't have the ability to infiltrate, uh, it's being used as a uh, as purely a storage device. Okay, and um, and I'm, almost, what I'm doing... it's almost equivalent to putting in another septic tank with a discharge or some form of concrete tank because you're they're not relying on the infiltration to dispose of the stormwater. Yeah, thanks. I'm trying to assess a comment that we got from the public, which, and I'll, let me give you the second part of the question. So sure. they had identified an element of the stormwater management plan, which I think we're talking about as cisterns, and then asked, is, is it an acceptable water quality practice? I, I think what I'm hearing is it's not water quality practice at all. Um, but I don't know if you have a, have a comment on, on that, whether, the, whether this is acceptable, you know, system. Um, the storage unit is not a water quality device. The water quality treatment is the pretreatment tank, the, the rainwater harvesting tank. That's okay. where they're obtaining their, they're, they're mitigating the, the quality aspects of the stormwater. And, and, and thanks. And while I have you, cause this is it for me on this topic. Um, so hopefully this is okay to kind of go out of turn, but um, I, from reading Estepan's, um, memo in the back and forth, which there has been open items and closed off items uh, on a holistic basis. Is it your guys's opinion that the stormwater management practice as proposed is um, adequate and meets, you know, all requirements? Yes, I think he was clear in his memo. I yeah. think the, the he he summed everything up. Uh, it, it does satisfy the New York State uh, guidelines for stormwater and the uh, village regulations. Thanks. Yeah, I think it is clear in the memo as well. It's very helpful to have you say it uh, while we're in the meeting. So th thank you. Sorry for the interruption, but maybe that was efficient. Yeah. And Commissioner Sellier, your cellular, your uh, bat and cleanup. Okay. I, I have uh, one question. It really is a follow up when what Seamus was asking. And it goes to the question of materiality of the 420 cubic yards of net fill. And I didn't, you know, I, I, I'd like to get a clear answer on that. You know, would a reasonable person living, a, a reasonable neighbor have a reasonable concern about this? People can be concerned about pretty much anything, but I, I you know, I think there's a question of 
in my mind, of materiality here. And I think Seamus posited 400 and 4,000 and 400,000. So uh, could, you, could you elaborate on your answer to what Seamus asked you a little bit? Again, if I was if I was a neighbor there on the other side, and you were proposing still in the center of your property that was four hundred and sixty or four hundred and eighty cubic yards, when the floodwaters come up, it's going to be that area now where they used to get floodwaters is no longer floodwaters, so it's going to push whatever's running in that there debris or whatever to my property. Is the water surface on my property going to be any higher? Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. I don't know if David knows what's next door. They're now enclosing it in. So the two areas are now closing in. So when water runs in, it takes debris with it. When it runs back out, it takes debris with it. So if it was me living next door, I'd be really concerned. Most and, and, and if you, based on, if you look at the way the properties are configured? Yep, I was out there. Yeah, it's, uh, again, they're making, they have, their, their island in front of their property now is at 12. It's not only 15.5, it's 3.5 feet higher. And it's bigger, it's three times the size or four times the size. So the water run, it has, as the sound comes up, the water running between the two houses is gonna be compressed to a smaller area and then compressed back out. As it runs back out. Because now you've pushed your boundaries closer to theirs. So, not trying to put words in your mouth, but you were, are you telling us that in your opinion, there would clearly could be a material effect, and that is a reasonable concern. You don't put any words in my mouth. There could be an effect. Okay. Can I ask Mr. Keller one follow-up question on the stormwater quality? On on the hierarchy of effectiveness for stormwater quality designs. Where would it, the sedimentation tank rank? Um, High effectiveness, I, mid effectiveness, low effectiveness. It's, it's more of a pretreatment. Uh, you you would prefer to have an infiltration system. It's a better practice, but you can only do so much with the property you're working with. You don't have the ability to infiltrate on this property, but I believe if it was a, a higher elevation property with better soils, similar to your, your septic systems, um, you would look at an infiltration practice. Yeah, would, it's, it's, would, run, would, running, would running the stormwater through some kind of filtering system be more effective than a, a sediment tank? Um, it would give you a higher level of treatment, yes. Andrew, let me jump in for a question that bugs me on this application. And again, I know the Department of Health approved it. I can't infiltrate the stormwater system because my groundwater is too high, so I'm going to discharge it, but I'm going to infiltrate my septic system. I just struggle with that. I struggle with it. It doesn't make sense to me. It's not a good engineering practice when I can run a sewer line and tie it in and not have that problem. So we listened to the applicant's uh, initial presentation and we've been through uh, questions with our consulting engineers, both Mr. Keller and Mr. Hippolyte. Um, I, th it, I think uh, now's the time to turn it back over to the applicant team, uh, hear what they have to say. Uh, Ms. Motel, you're welcome to um, have any of your folks uh, respond to what's been said so far. I expect we may also have some questions for uh, for the members of the applicant team. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, I'm going to have Leonard Jackson start and then Jim Ryan and Rich Cordone address some of the engineering questions as well. Um, keeping in mind that the focus of tonight and the hearing really is consistency with the LWRP policies and um, specifically, Phil is the focus. Um, so, what are, what are the policies that are impacted by the proposed fill? Um, I know the policies don't address any impact, whether it's one cubic yard or zero, they address things like harm to persons or property. And they address specific 
concerns and impacts as they relate to the fill. So that's what I'm going to ask uh, my experts to focus on is the, the impacts as they relate to the LWRP policies, not general concerns over um, the septic design. Now I did hear um, Mazur confirm that there was no uh, zero cubic yard solution for a septic system in this case. So um, with that in mind, we'll focus on the fill because the fill is being driven entirely by the septic system that has been approved by the, the County Department of Health. And I will note that um, a fa I, I heard what Mazur said that, that a failing septic system is a concern. Certainly we are taking out the failing septic system. Uh, there are county code requirements, and I, and I know JMC will go into this, that require maintenance, that require consistent monitoring. And I know the applicants would be willing to provide the village with copies of all of the monitoring logs and the maintenance that is required. Um, but before they do that, I'm going to ask uh, Leonard Jackson to discuss some of the flood volume storage concerns and the floodplain issues that were raised. So Lenny, are you able to hear everything? Can you... Are you able to speak? Amber, do you, do you see uh, Leonard Jackson as an attendee? Can he be elevated to panelist if he's not? Okay, I'm in. Uh, let me address a few things that uh, I just heard uh, from Mr. Hippolyte, uh, which I disagree greatly. The one thing I do agree is that there is an effect. Uh, just, as, just as if I jump right now, my mass time velocity will equal the Earth's mass time velocity and the Earth will move in the opposite direction. Uh, and there is an effect. If I go swimming in the, in the Atlantic Ocean, I display certain volume of water. Where does that water go? There's an effect. But those are the kind of effects we're talking about. When we displace flood storage on Long Island Sound, and we will displace flood storage on Long Island Sound, uh, there's a similar effect, uh, just the way it's like jump right now, the earth will move. But you will not measure that. I don't think you can calculate it. It's something having to do with the uh, what tide is it and and the height of the moon and so forth and so on. There's no measurable effect with regard to this fill. Okay, the the flood elevation on Long Island Sound will not be uh, measurable. It doesn't matter how much you study it; you won't be able to measure it. We, we don't have numbers that small to come up with it, but there will be an effect, no question about it. Um, the second thing is, uh, there was a discussion about uh, if, if you were a neighbor, would you be concerned uh, about flooding if somebody put in a fill? Well, that's, that's a broad question. If the, if the neighbor was a dentist, he might be concerned. But the fact is, when you put a fill on this site, uh, the, the, the way anything is affected, it's not as though the, 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 the fill displaces a certain amount of water that would have been in the site and shoves it somewhere else. It certainly doesn't work that way. If, if you displace flood storage on the site, this means the, the, the storage will never come into the site. It will never come into the area. Uh, it, just, it just won't have any effect, any local effect whatsoever. If there's an effect at all, it's going to be an effect on Long Island Sound and maybe perhaps the Atlantic Ocean, but it's not going to be a local effect. There was a, one other thing that almost had merit and that was, if, if you place a fill and, and create a constriction <clears throat> on a site uh, or on an inlet, say, uh, then depending on the elevation of the water on the other side of this constriction, you'll have a certain velocity where the water enters and exit, kind of like an inlet. Let's take you know, any inlet, Shinnecock Inlet. Uh, the width of Shinnecock Inlet, for instance, controls the elevation of Shinnecock Bay with regard to the elevation of the Atlantic Ocean. And depending on the elevation and the rate of the rise of the tide, you will affect the elevation. If there were a constriction placed on this particular site, if there were any effect at all, and I don't, and there is none, uh, what a constriction does is reduces the amount of water that gets past the constriction. But in this instance, it's no such thing. There is no constriction. 
There's no inlet. It's just a matter of the water rises, the water goes down. There's no measurable difference in elevation. And certainly there's no water pushed from one site to another. There's no water from, from, from this address at Grecian Point to the address next door. It just doesn't happen. There's nothing at all ever like that. And this whole, this whole discussion really should be focused on if it's an environmental issue, that's fine. If it's a septic issue, that's fine. But as far as flooding, you cannot measure the difference in flood elevation or the effect in flooding with regard to this fill on this site. It's a non-issue. Uh, thank you, Lenny. Do the commissioners have any questions for Mr. Jackson before I ask our JMC engineers to speak? Well, I do. Uh, so, Mr. Jackson, if you, as a as a matter of of, of land use generally, if you allow uh, net fill in uh, tidal floodplains, it allows for more development in tidal floodplains than if if the municipality does not. Is that fair to say? Apparently, your municipality has an issue regarding net fill in a floodplain. Well, okay. that, that's yeah. the regulation apparently. Yeah, but, but but that's not what I asked. You. If you if if you have a rule that bars net fill in tidal floodplain, that's going to tend to permit less development than if you don't have such a rule, right? That's true. Why don't you just say there won't be any development in the floodplain? Yeah. Done with it. But I had a follow-up question. Okay. The development that will additionally be allowed if you allow. Uh, net fill in a tidal floodplain is sort of by definition going to be on those lots, tend to be on those lots that are going to be surrounded if they are filled and then there's a flood, right? Yes, I follow. Yes, if somebody builds today in a flood zone, they're by law required to elevate the building and the dwelling and so forth and so on. So if people in the past built around that area when they didn't know what the flood elevation was going to be, yes, they will be lower, and the people and the new developments will be higher. Yes. Right, and so that would mean that the developments that are most in need of net fill in order to do what they want to do are also going to be those that are, in event of a flood, most likely to be cut off by flood waters. Is that fair to say? Those are the places where, in a flood, you go to be safe. Yes. Okay, but also the places that are toughest to get to for a rescue because they're surrounded by floodwaters. Well, that's quite true, of course. Okay. All right. All right. I, I, I understand your answers. Uh, Incidentally, I speak with some authority in that because where I'm sitting right now, I'm surrounded by water. Any of the other commissioners have questions for Mr. Jackson? Um, maybe a response from Mr. Hippolyte, if, if you have any, uh, what Mr. Jackson said made sense to me, I suppose, in that you put a little bit of fill in one property and maybe you raise the entire Long Island Sound and Atlantic Ocean by an immeasurable fraction of a fraction of an inch, and maybe it doesn't have an impact on the neighbor. Um, it does make some sense to me about velocity of, of you know, Water flow. Um, do you have a reaction to, to that to that those comments? So a couple of things. One is, if in fact this net fill has no effect, then just raise the whole property to fifteen. Why do we care? Take the entire property, raise it to fifteen, and call it a day. So now you're just going to make sure you push the water to your neighbor and make sure there's an effect on them. And they're scraping and scraping to get to your highland when there's a flood. When I look at the map, again, I don't have the data, but their elevation 15 is, I don't know, 60 by 60, 50 by 50, goes down at a two to one slope, down to elevation six and starts going up to elevation 10. So this, this fill by nature is causing a swell down the side of both properties. That swell. When more flood wars come in and go out, that swell is going to lead to erosion. I don't know what's going to do to the next door nearest property because there's no evaluation of it. You know, we used, we used to use an example. If I take if I take this cup and I pour it in the ocean, would anybody know the ocean rise? Of course not. 
your village is not looking at the Long Island Sound. You're not looking at the Atlantic Ocean. You're looking at the street they're on and what effect it has to the properties that surround it. If his argument's true, then they should just be able to fill the property to 15, raise it up, and who cares about the neighbor? Who cares? It has an effect. If it didn't have an effect, when Hurricane Sandy hit Long Island, there would have been no problems. Every place would have been fine. But it comes. Those storms come. Lucky enough, on this side, you were on the back side of it, so you didn't have the same effect. But think of those waters rushing in here. Right now, it's an A10 zone, but you get some velocities, and the velocities may be low, but the water's still running up. There's going to be erosion between those properties because they're pushing their fill and their water towards somebody else. And so for you to decide, it's just, it has an effect. If it had no effect, then again, let them fill the whole property. Who cares? Oh. Before, before I ask JMC to provide a response, uh, I note that we are proposing the minimum fill that is required here to reuse the existing house. There's no additional development. We're actually improving the environmental conditions as they exist today on site with the failing septic system and a wetland being maintained as lawn. Uh, but aside from that, uh, we did hire and the applicants did retain uh, several experts to study the impacts of the flood volume storage to study the impact. So we, we do know that the 420 cubic yards proposed is not going to harm human life or personal property as is, as is addressed in the LWRP policies. Um, so I just wanted to, to make that note. Again, if you want me to stop, I'll stop. Your existing house is bigger than is, your existing house is smaller than your new house. You're not, I don't want the board, unless I have a different set of plans. When I look at your existing house, it's their footprint is much smaller than what you're proposing. So I don't, it all kind of adds up. Well, you, the, the, I mean, you could say, hey, we have an existing house, we have an existing septic, we're going to fix our house no footprint, fix our septic to our 462 yards of fill. And I think that's the best you can do. You can say, the board would say, hey, you're doing the best you can. You're taking away a hazard. You're fixing it inside the footprint. You're doing good. That's not what you're doing. You say, we want a bigger house and we want to fill for a septic and we don't want to put a sewer line. You're, wanna, you're doing the best of all worlds. Yeah. I, so I've tried not just for the people in front of us, but for the people who may some sometime be in front of us. I try to work pretty hard to make sure that discussions stay focused on what this commission considers and we don't do things that look like balancing tests we do things that look like consistency so uh i i don't want us to get lost in a in a this is better than that or trade-off analysis that's not what we do here uh, go ahead ms motel i i completely understand chairman burr and i i also just wanted to remind the commission and it was in bill's presentation earlier but there is no increase in impervious surface proposed at the site um, in fact it is staying the same so i i just wanted to point that out as well as um and this is a perfect opportunity to turn it over to rich and jim from jmc to explain that if we were to keep the existing home to, in order to use the existing septic system, there would actually be more fill required and we would be back before this board with, with a proposal for more fill than what we are proposing today. So actually Rich and Jim, would you guys uh, mind addressing that and, and some of the other comments that were made regarding stormwater? Hey Richard. Hello. All right, Jim, do you want me to start? Yeah, I want to start, please. Okay. Um, first and foremost, what we did is, um, uh, where to start? Okay. Regarding the septic system, the septic system works in a number of different ways. You have primary treatment that happens and primary and secondary treatment within your septic tank where your anaerobic bacteria or your aerobic bacteria is eat away at the solids depositing and it winds up sinking to the bottom and you have a separate layer of sludge that builds up on the top and solids that build up all the way on the bottom. And um, an effluent liquid as opposed to the influent that comes in is going to go out to your septic system where then it gets goes into absorption trenches where it gets an additional secondary treatment at the absorption trenches where it's um, uh, the, the effluent is disposed of 
by, or the, yeah, broken down further by a bacteria that live in what's called the biomat. And that is the, that's the, um, that's the media in between the gravel on the trenches and the soil. Now, what we have is from that biomat to the impervious surface, which is rock, we have five feet of separation. Um, we did not encounter groundwater at the top where we were doing um, a proposed septic system. We encountered groundwater. In order to maintain that separate area between the two points, what we did is we had uh, between the bottom of the percolate uh, of the septic absorption trenches and the top of the rock, we had to elevate that fill. Now, there's not necessarily groundwater that's going to be um, every day in, in the septic area. There's going to be, when a 100-year storm comes up, you may get some water coming through here. Groundwater was not noticed. Modeling was not observed. There was no groundwater up at the septic, uh, proposed septic area. So a groundwater modeling and uh, mounding analysis in this area is there's no groundwater present. There's really no way to do a groundwater modeling uh, analysis uh, on top of the septic system. Um, <clears throat> furthermore, there is maintenance that's required by a septic system. The septic tank is required to be pumped every two years. Every two to three years, a septic tank is required to be pumped. The cost of this pumping is approximately $250 to $350 every three years that the applicant's gonna to have to pay for. I don't think that they have any problem paying for that or handling that. Um, it's far south of the $20,000 a year number that was initially anticipated. And, and, and Rich, you can, you can point out to a septic system is never pumped three to four times a year. That's, that's absurd. Correct. That just, that that's just absurd. doesn't happen. And every time the septic system gets pumped, this licensed pumper has to send Paperwork, they have to send a, a brief inspection report of what they find to Westchester County Department of Health. If there's any indication of any type of a problem or anything like that, the Westchester County Department of Health takes immediate action. Um, Mr. Hippolyte said right out, a functioning septic system that's well-maintained can last a long time. There's plenty of septic systems in the area that last 30 to 50 years, as long as they're maintained. Today's soaps and everything else do not have near the amount of impact on a septic system as they used to in the past. A lot of the detergents and everything everybody are using is green, green, green. There's a lot less caustic chemicals that are going into there and everything else. The possibility of leaching coming from the septic system and getting into the groundwater Though it may be something, the chances are very, very slim. Um, septic systems are an approved and acceptable method of waste disposal and have been for many, many years. Um, and Rich, is it um, just to comment, isn't it true that there are a number of, of septic systems in this area that this is not um, breaking yes. new ground here? Yes, there's, I believe, five or six septic systems on Grecian Point Road alone. And we have no indication of any major issues of failing with those based on health department records? That's correct. There's nothing based on health department or records of anything failing. And, and the fact that we're putting in a new septic system as opposed to the septic system that was installed somewhere around 1953, 67 years ago, um, the standards are much, much more rigorous in terms of the health department review of these, uh, wouldn't you say? Absolutely. They, they didn't have the, the same separation. Um, requirements that they have today. The bottom of the septic trenches are at um, elevation, approximately elevation 13.5, which is actually six inches above the uh, the hundred year floodplain. And as you all know, a hundred year floodplain is is a storm that happens that doesn't necessarily indicate the level of groundwater. That's just um, you know that's an expected level of, of water that could be coming in. Now, in between that septic system and uh, the, the, the Long Island Sound, we have uh, over 200 feet of, of ground to expect that the, the water underneath the septic system is gonna rise to elevation 13 in a 100 year storm is, is, is absurd to think that that's gonna happen. Um, 100 year storms typically last for moments. They don't last for hours that have a, a, sub, uh, you know, a substantial ability to raise the groundwater. Rich, I'd like you to comment too on the elevations of the buildings on I, or the properties on either side of this property because it was yeah, that's the other suggestion thing. That's that, the other suggesting that that water will flow directly onto these uh, 
uh, and creating an impact because of this 420 cubic yards of fill. Can you comment on that? Yeah, Chairman Burt, one, one, thing, one thing you stated before is, is you said if everybody in the surrounding properties raised their grade, you would have this one lower property. Am I correct? You asked Leonard Jackson about that as, as to how, how, how the village it would be, you know, am I, am I, did I misunderstand you? In, unless you're referring to something that I said at a, at a different meeting. No, you're. It, I recall it, you asking earlier, if you were to allow newer developments to raise the fill, the older to, to raise their grade, the effect that that would have on other properties that wouldn't be developed. No, I, something about that? That, no, I, you're, you, I think you I misunderstood heard what I said. My 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 question was about what development is allowed by a more lenient view of net fill. Okay. Understood. Right. So I'm not. That wasn't a question specific to the to the effect on the neighboring properties. It was, and I, you know, I don't mean to play hide the ball with my question. I'm asking a question about the overall impact of public safety. If you if if you chuck the no net fill rule and say we don't think that that matters for coastal flooding as opposed to riverine flooding, right? I, look, I can follow the discussion from the hydrologists. I, I, understand the, I understand the math of Long Island Sound. And the, and the implication of that would be, as, as Mr. Hipplet pointed out, the implication of that would be, at least for riverine purposes, for the purpose of the flooding thinking that we do. Who cares? Raise it all up. And my, my question went to this. So if the only consideration was, will it spill onto the neighbor's property? I could see how you get to that conclusion. But then if you, if you tend to make available more development in higher flood elevation coastal properties, aren't you also tending by doing that to put more people and more property in places on the coast that flood more? Doesn't that tend, I mean, obviously, if you put something up high enough and leave people there long enough, the they'll, they'll flood will eventually go away. But if you, the more you forward the cause of developing in coastal floodplains, aren't you also, by doing that, putting more people and more property in exactly the places that are endangered whenever there is coastal flooding? That was the import of my question. So, I mean, look, these are public proceedings, right? Mm -hmm. we, it's not just for you and me. We do this for public land use and everybody who's listening. So I don't want to be obscure about what I'm asking. What I was asking is, isn't it, isn't it in part a, a, an important prophylactic check that you have some rules where you just say, I think there ought to be limits to where you can put people because sometimes putting more people in coastal areas that flood more uh, is just putting more people in harm's way. That was the import of my question. So I don't, I, I think I was asking a different thing than you thought I was asking. So I don't know if you want to respond to it. I, I misunderstood a little bit, I did. Thank you, Chairman. I, I actually would like to respond to that and, um, Jim and Rich, feel free to continue once I'm mm -hmm. finished. But I, I understand, and I, what I'm hearing too is a concern also about the, the precedent this will set for other properties in the village. Um, I do think, I think our experts have demonstrated in our submissions over the last 15 months have demonstrated that this is an extremely unique property. This is a unique set of circumstances that will not be replicated in other areas of the village given the constraints, given what's driving the project. And this is, aside from the pure speculation of the impact, looking at this application, it's consistent with our poli with the LWRP policies as, as is proposed here. Ms. Ms. Motel, um, you're, I'm a litigator. And so I know good advocacy when I see it. You're, you're a good lawyer, right? It, it, leaving aside issues that go to the, the merits of the application. You've been before me more than, more than a couple of times now. And when, when you say that this is a unique set of circumstances that will create no precedent, uh, it, it, it's certainly in the best interest of your client to say that. It was in the best interest of this client for you to also to say to me, uh, as soon as I raised a concern on this application about allowing uh, fill in a coastal floodplain that 
this commission has in the past, and even I once did uh, approve uh, fill on a property that uh, had coastal floodplain on it. And that narrowly constructed, of course, that's true. And that was a unique situation too. In fact, my recollection is that on that property, the, the, the fill was actually outside the portion of the property that was coastal floodplain. So the property had coastal floodplain on it, but the fill wasn't in the coastal floodplain. I remember I asked you about that. And for the other properties, you were able to supply a, a map that marked the location of the fill. And uh, we apparently don't have that for, for the one that we were speaking about. I'm pretty sure I remember it right. Uh, and I thought that was, I thought that was distinguishable. And the next time you appear in front of me, if it's in your client's interest to tell me that that property is no different from this one and this wasn't so unique after all, it's your obligation as a lawyer to tell me that it wasn't so different and it's replicated. Well, I understand. I, I, I mean, speaking purely from the facts of this application, though, there's there's no an impervious surface. Right? The, the, the fill is solely for the septic system in this case. The septic system is constraining where the house can be in this case. Um, there is no public sewer line on this road. There is no feasible, there's no public sewer line in this case. So I think that when we look at the facts of the application, and I certainly hear what you're saying, and I understand where you're coming from. Um, it's the commission's duty, it's what they're tasked with, is to look at the merits and the details of each application. Um, so, so I do ask that we, and we can continue with, with JMC's um, opining on this, of course, but I do ask that we focus on the impact of the fill as it relates the, to the LWRP policies, because I think what's being demonstrated here and what's been demonstrated over the last 15 months is that the fill is consistent with those LWRP policies. So I understand from an overarching village concern on floodplain development, we do, but but it's our job also to make sure that we're addressing your concerns as they relate to this property in this. Okay. And, and I'm listening and I can't speak for any other commissioner, but I, I find this an extremely useful discussion. If, if you assume that, that I believe that honoring policy 11 as written means that we should that that this commission should interpret the no net fill rule as being a bar to developing in coastal floodplains for the purpose of keeping people and property out of harm's way when these big floods come and i think we all agree that they're becoming more common in an overdriven climate system if if you assume i believe that tell me what it is about this property that is unique to this property and would differentiate it from anyone else who says, well, I got a piece of coastal floodplain too, but I want to put a nice single family dwelling there too. Sure. Would you, would you like me to address each one of those? E each thing that we believe creates the uniqueness in this application? Because yes. A yes. A list would be very useful to me right now. Sure, sure. I'll start and um, I, I, I'm going to ask the engineers to weigh in because they are more familiar with the, the engineering details that are unique in this case. But as I said, there is no increase in impervious surface. There is no public sewer connection on the street. You have a house that hasn't been updated since 1953 that is served with a septic system that has also not been updated and is failing. We are proposing to remove portions of the existing lawn that is in the wetlands and create a wetland restoration and habitat. R Rich and Jim, can you provide um, stormwater details and engineering details that are specific? Sure. The, the, uh, the current regulations require uh, stormwater management, stormwater treatment, water quality, and water quantity. Uh, this property will have that, probably unlike most of the neighbor neighboring properties uh, within this area. Um, and I think just picking up on your point on the septic system, there is the health department would not approve a septic system where there's a reasonable alternative for a public sewer. In this particular case, the health department is charged with the responsibility of protecting the, the, the health and safety 
of, of citizens of that area and the environment collectively too. We went through a rather rigorous process to make sure we had a current design and updated design and it was eventually approved. And again, in the instance where there is a reasonable alternative for a sewer uh, provision, if, if the community would uh, install a sewer line uh, and force the people or ask the request the people to, to connect to that too, we would be looking at that as a reasonable alternative that does not exist in this particular case. So that makes us unique, I think unique in that the health department reviewed this. We did a comprehensive analysis for them. We provided all the information to show uh, that this works. And, and along with the stormwater system, which uh, Mr. Keller's office uh, reviewed too, we met all the requirements in terms of stormwater. And again, those don't exist. And, and there are other septic systems in this vicinity too that don't meet this high standard that we had to meet in order to achieve the approval of the health department. And again, nor do they meet probably the requirements of uh, this community with regard to stormwater management too. So that makes this property unique as well. So, uh, so I want to stop you there for just a sec. For, sure. First of all, you just mentioned that there were a bunch of other septics in the area. And I, 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 and I know that's true. I wanted to ask you, when was mm -hmm. the last time a new septic was built on Grecian Point Road? Richard, do you know that? Yeah, it was last it was last year a septic system was renovated for uh, one of the houses down on Grecian Point Road. Okay, thank you. Uh, I would Ms. also Ms. add Hi. one more point here that um, the fill and I, I know I said this earlier the fill is 100% being driven for the septic. Um, it's it's not used for anything else on the property. Right. I got that. Now I would just like to address, I'm sorry, one, one procedural point as well. Uh, and I know you're concerned with precedent going forward and focusing on the uniqueness of this application. I would just like to remind the commission that uniqueness is not a standard for consistency with the LWRP. Uh, we're merely pointing out the specifics as it relates to this proposal, this proposal that's before you, the merits of this application as it relates to the application of the policies. And, and, I, and I know you're concerned about someone using this application as a precedent going forward, but that's not the standard that the commission respectfully you know, has to or is required to apply in this instance. No. Yeah. I appreciate that, Mr. Joffrey. No, no one's arguing that you've shifted your own standard by engaging in the discussion. You haven't. I'm, I'm just as, as I think you're, you're familiar with, with, uh, with this commission. I'm just making my concerns as transparent as possible. And here, uh, well, what we're talking about when we talk about, especially policy eleven, is inherently a public policy standard. And therefore, you know, we can't, we can't avoid talking about what this would mean. And we are talking about it only in the context of this. We're, we're talking about it only in the context of this property, but we're talking about it in, in the context of this property in considering the value of a, what is functionally a prophylactic safety rule. So can I understand you, what you said? Could, could Kristen, uh, would it be appropriate for Beth Evans to comment on the environmental impact of snow? Mr. Hippolyte had commented that this could have potentially impact all of the, the factors I think that uh, Mr. O'Rourke had brought up too. I don't think that that's, that's true either. So maybe Ms. Evans could, could comment on the environmental impact of this development. Yes, thank before, you for reminding me here. Before we go to that, um, could, could, cause I feel like we're just dancing around this and not hitting it. Um, could, could we talk about, you, you mentioned a few times the septics or the fill is only for the septic, clear. Um, but at some point we have to address why doing less or doing, doing less would require more fill. Or, I'm not posing it yes. right. Do, do okay. mind? Yes. Okay. Because if we do less work, there's less development that would be, um, right now the existing home is a slab on grade. Um, so that slab on grade right now, um, well, not even the slab on, you can only remove as much material as you can from behind that slab on grade to lower that elevation behind that building to, to elevation nine. Uh, or I believe it's 10. Um, also, if you look, there's a smaller, there's a rain garden that we have constructed in the back of the site where we're actually using that rain garden. It's a small depression. We're using that as a kind of like a, a level spreader. So that way, any water that comes out of the stormwater system can settle out a little bit more. Um, and then we, there's also on the other side of the site, there's a little bit of a depression that was able to be excavated. So we took all these areas and all these little things and they all added up to being able to remove it a little bit. 
Uh, if we were to, like I said, like we said before, and as we've discussed, if we were to just propose a repair, a septic repair, we would have to provide um, three and a half feet of fill over approximately a 5,500 square foot area. And, um, you know, if you just do that, that works out to about 680 square yards because you do have setbacks you have to do. So to pose it back, I, I think I mostly get it. I think what you're saying is, because I think three and a half feet over that distance is about what's happening, but you, are you saying you wouldn't have access to the cut to get to the net fill? Yeah, because uh, we wouldn't be able to excavate behind the building um, because that existing building is at a certain grade that it is now. Uh, there would be substantial underpinning and then, you know, it's unusable space. Uh, we would have to, and then, uh, where our garage is now, we're, we're doing a little bit of a cut there, lowering that grade uh, where the stormwater system is. There's just so many little different things that add up to, to wind up saving us about 200 yards of fill. I have to jump in on this. So the existing building is 13.1. Contour 10 runs around the building. And, and then there's a finger that runs all the way out kind of in a, a left direction towards the sound. They could balance that 200 square foot by just cutting back a little bit of that. So you're it, going to get 200 yards out of a, out of 200 square feet. No, I'm not saying 200 square feet, but you have you have an area if you look at your plan. So go to plan sheet C10. You have it in front of you. Yes, or no? yes, I'm looking at it. Okay, so, so you're saying you have, a, oh, 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 Rich, hold on. you have you have you have a line that's green on there. It's elevation 10. Mm -hmm. So what, what elevation is the building? The existing building, what's the elevation? The building's at 13. The building's at 13. So, so if I cut that 10 to be no closer than it currently is behind the screen porch, I have an area in the back left side of the property where I can make up that difference so you'd never be okay. more than the proposed. So, so you, have, you have a couple yards of fill that you can remove yes, there. Yes, yeah. And then we also were able to remove more material by where the garage is. So, okay, so maybe we're not looking at 680, maybe we're looking at 70, 660, but there's still substantially more fill in the, if we were to just revitalize the existing septic system in the front of the house, as opposed to, um, you know, doing a full development of the site. Also, there's additional fill that would have to be required there, because if you recall, I forgot about this, there, we have an existing water line that runs right through the, eh, now we can move that water line, but there's, you know, it, it's a no, tight. So you, can't, you can't tell the board, uh, I'm only just a professional, but you can't get the same amount of fill in the proposed as the existing. It's absurd. You could definitely do it. I'm not going to do the math for you, but you definitely can do yeah. it. If your answer is no, you're, you're, not, you're not truthful. That's, and you've done the calculation, of course. Of course I have. It's easy to do. You could do it right now. I could do it in five minutes. I just, need a, I just need a ruler. It's easy. You got plenty of room. You're moving this soil around your proposed condition. You could do it in your existing. It's no big deal. It's 200 cubic yards. It's nothing. We're, we're... I, well, hey, for, for, for what it's worth, um, and Chairman Burke, feel free to do what you want. Um, for, for what it's worth, that was a helpful explanation of how you guys are thinking about it. It sounds like everyone probably agrees. Whatever you do, you're not doing it for much less than 460, and that's what we're considering. So I'm 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 fine at this point if others are. But yeah, I I don't feel a particular need to get lost in 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 you know how low they could get uh, the the hypothetical but for world scenario where where they were rehabilitating the existing system. Uh, that's it's not useful to have a fight over that. Uh, but you know I. It, if the applicant wants to bring up Ms. Evans, um, I have I have zero problem with hearing from Dr. Evans again. Thank you, Beth. I'd like you to just address some of the environmental comments that were raised on the project. Um, Amber, Beth Evans is our consultant. I believe she might not be elevated to panelist. Thank you. Hi, Beth. You're on mute, Dr. Evans. We cannot hear you, Beth. You're still on mute. Check check your mic because your screen mute is not on. Says 
that I'm using. There you are. We can, hear, we you. can hear you now. Good, Good evening. Um, uh, I would just remind the commission that on this particular site, I'm talking about cutting and, and things. When we look at the wetland area and what, uh, where the hydric soils on this site are, uh, when I looked at this property, there's something missing in the wetland portion of it, and that's topsoil. And the, the properties on either side of it, um, there's a, a significant rise in elevation to get to those properties. At some point, historically, um, the wetland was, in my opinion, severely impacted and altered on this site. And prior to uh, Bill and his wife buying it, uh, I believe that area was mowed as lawn. So what we're proposing uh, within the wetland itself is actually a restoration of that wetland and uh, a significant enhancement of the wetland functions and the wetland habitat on this site. And when I was brought on board, I um, made sure that the applicants understood exactly what I recommended they did and they're willing to, happy to, um, implement that mitigation plan. And so in terms of, of functions, um, I'm not an engineer. I, I don't pretend to um, have the expertise that the engineers uh, who have spoken tonight do. But as a wetland scientist, I can tell you that this application uh, proposes a lot of benefits to the wetlands, to Delancey Cove. And um, I think that overall water quality in Delancey Cove adjacent to this site will improve uh, if they stop mowing the wetland and let it replant and repopulate with wetland species. I'd be happy to answer any questions. I'm gonna let others start because I've, uh, I've been talking a lot. Um, Seamus. Um, sure. Um, I, Dr. Evans, I'm not sure if this will be for you. I'll throw it out because it's, it's my one environmental question, I think, still on my list. But I do want to say that um, I find that the restoration of the back of the property, which I've visited from a lawn to um, wetland habitat or natural, is, is very compelling and I think a good um, stewardship of the land. Um, do you, um, Dr. Evans, or maybe JMC will want to jump in? Um, have any um, have any comment on a comment that was made that the septic system discharges below the floodplain from an environmental perspective? Um, I'm still trying to understand that just so that people don't think I'm not paying attention or someone. I, I understand that well maintained, everyone pretty much agrees no impact, but I but I'm just trying to assess the I guess periodic flood event where uh, the, the septic system and, uh, and hopefully some discussion here will help me to uh, crystallize all this where the system is discharging you know, below the floodplain. If I can just, um, first I'm, I appreciate being elevated to uh, doctor status, but I, I actually don't have a PhD, no. but <laughs> thank that, you. That, that was me, I'm sorry. No, that's all right. I just didn't want to have an impression that uh, I've somehow gotten my degree when I haven't. Um, so you're in good company. <laughs> <laughs> um, in terms of, of groundwater impact on a, on a coastal uh, area like this, um, it is typically uh, more of a problem when saltwater intrudes um, into the soil and, and starts to uh, be drawn into uh, the, the local freshwater groundwater. Um, so I'm not particularly concerned that uh, groundwater contaminants are going to move into Delancey Cove and impact the quality of water in Delancey Cove. I would be more concerned if I were the applicant that uh, Delancey Cove was going to move inland and uh, impact freshwater under my, under my property. Uh, so with that said, again, there's lawn there now. Um, they are, they're happy to have the wetland restored and that wetland will do a uh, very efficient and, and commendable job to hold stormwater during flood events and also to filter water moving toward Delancey Cove. Thanks, helpful and kind of new perspective. I think that was a great comment, thank you. 
Andrew? I am fine, Thomas. Thank you. Uh, Lisa or Randy? I'm good. Okay. Uh, Ms. Evans, I, I don't have any other questions for you. Thank you. I'm, I'm, I'll stay on if there are. Appreciate that. Do, do, any of the, um, do any of the engineers want to add anything to that? I'm still, I'm just, the, the point of saltwater coming in versus groundwater going out was clear to me. I just don't know if anyone wants to add to um, how we should understand the septic system discharging below the floodplain for periodic events. Trying to encapsulate it a little more. We've had a, a, a discussion about it that I don't think we need to rehash. I don't know if anyone wants to try to summarize. Rich, just maybe a comment on the separation between the bottom of the septic area or the disposal area and the groundwater uh, as it was tested and provided to the health department. Yes. So no groundwater was encountered in the septic area when we did test pits with the health department. There was no and indication. How, how deep did you do the testing? We, we did excavations. We did excavations to four feet and where we hit refusal at rock. Um, there was no indication of modeling which is, it, which is an indicator of uh, seasonally high groundwater within the soils. Um, by, doing, by doing these test pits and observing and seeing that separation, we are raising the fill in the front of the site to obtain a separation from the impervious layer, which is rock and the bottom of the system. Now the bottom of our, our, our sanitary sewer trenches, the actual absorption trenches themselves where the uh, where the uh, interaction between the soil media and the effluent actually take place is about six inches higher. It's at elevation 13.5, which is six inches higher than the 100-year floodplain. Now, it should be noted that the 100-year floodplain, it does not mean that's the elevation that groundwater gets. That's an elevation that um, water's been um, observed at during um, a 100-year flood. Um, whether or not that water is actually going to be under the ground and it's actually going to be mixing with the septic system, there's no indication that that's going to happen. I don't know if uh, Leonard, um, Mr. Jackson, if you can comment on that too. I mean, the the, the impact of, of the 100-year flood is that doesn't vary the groundwater conditions substantially because of the duration, I would assume. Uh, maybe you can comment on that. Oh. You're muted. You're on mute, Mr. Jackson. Uh, that's correct. It takes uh, quite some time for salt water to uh, to permeate into the the soils, uh, and the flood event could last perhaps not 12 hours, maybe somewhat longer. But uh, it's doubtful that the salt water will uh, will get the, uh, to the area where the uh, septic system is discharging. It's going to be a, a very rapid event as compared to uh, the, uh, the function of the septic system and the soil. I don't think will be affected beneath it. Thanks. Yeah, that, I, that was a bit of a rehash, but really helpful for me. Um, wrap my arms around it. Thanks. Kristen, I don't think we have anything else on the engineering side. Thank you. Are there any questions for any of the team from members of the commission? Ms. Motel, if, if nobody's going to jump in on that, I, I'm, I'm going to tell you that I'm, I'm sort of still in the discussion you and I were having about, uh, about floodplains and safety before, um, before uh, uh, Mr. Joffrey jumped in. So, can I jump in? Uh, you're, you're a floodplain expert, so I guess that would be appropriate. I was thinking about what you were saying, that you, you don't want to, uh, let's say, you create new hazardous areas that people would feel safe and then be isolated. But I, uh, I think, isn't this a redevelopment project so that you're not creating any new areas for people who are already living there, and you're just improving it and making it uh, safer, let's say, because after these current regulations. So this is, in fact, a unique site because it's a, an existing site and you're just going to improve it. I, I don't know if that helps or not, but I, that's how I see it. 
Well, I, I think that's a useful discussion. Thank you. But so, so Ms. Ms. Motel, when, when you and I were talking about, about this specific issue, about whether, whether, by, whether our obligation to keep people and property out of harm's way in coastal flood, in, in all floodplains, including coastal floodplains, um, should cause us to think of the no net fill rule as uh, a way to provide a prophylactic safety margin. I, I, I said a, use, a list for me would be very useful at this point. And the things you listed were things about the property that, that really weren't specific to, to flood safety. There were things that were you know, different from other applications about the property. Um, and for example, that it was environmentally beneficial that they, that they would be uh, returning the, the lower part of the uh, wetland barrier to a to a natural condition, all of which, for various reasons, we may we may like. But as, as Mr. Jaffrey said, we're we have to keep this you know we have to keep this siloed to the issues we're actually properly considering. What is it about? And and Mr. Jackson's comment actually went to it. What is it about the problems inherent in letting people use net fill to develop? projects they otherwise wouldn't be that is uniquely different and not a problem for this property, for the safety of the people who will live in the house so that I don't feel like I am, I don't like how I'm phrasing that, so that I don't find myself at odds with my duty to keep people out of the out of dangerous places consistent with with policy 11. I understand based on what our our experts have um, have told you tonight there the the elevation of the property the existing conditions the soils on site those all factor into your concerns about policy 11 specifically regarding the flooding. Um, I, I believe I heard Jim and Rich address uh, specific conditions on site that, can tr that, that are factored in when we're looking at uh, flood levels. Jim, I don't know if you, if you wanna reiterate those. I, I mean, I believe the, the, the way the property is situated where it's located in a cove as opposed to open Long Island Sound is one of the key um, key factors to consider here, um, as well as the elevation. No, I, I think those are, those are the relevant points. This is a redevelopment as, as Mr. Jackson has indicated too. We're trying to stay within the parameters of the existing site. So we're not dramatically changing uh, what's out there. The only thing that's changing the site is the septic system is because we have no viable alternative for public sewer. Um, we are minimizing the impacts uh, with the design and the health department uh, evidently feels the same that we've minimized the impacts and um, we're, we're working within the constraints of the health department guidelines which are there to protect the public. Right. And so um, So letter, maybe you're, you, maybe you're better suited to, to help me explain this here. Um, the way our site is situated compared to other properties in the village, other coastal properties in the village, can you explain in with, with some level of detail how this, this site will not, is different in that it will not impact, um, negatively impact or harm private property or, or human life as, as it relates to, to the flooding and the flood concerns? Well, this being in an AE zone, that means that the waves are not a concern. If, if this were a coastal area in a V zone, then when you place a fill in a certain area, then you have to consider what happens when waves are deflected. And then they do, in fact, could affect the neighboring properties. But in this particular instance, um, uh, there's no such thing. The water rises slowly and, and goes down slowly. So velocities are not a concern, waves are not a concern. And in fact, uh, with regard to um, the original displacement of storage from one site, from this particular site, when you place a fill, there's no displacement of floodwaters to the adjacent site. What happens is the water that used to inundate the area on the, our particular site just doesn't get inundated. 
the adjacent site remains inundated. There's no, there's no conservation of flood storage. Uh, the neighborhood that's affected by, by a fill placement in, in this particular area, the neighbor should be considered not the local area, but Long Island Sound is the neighbor, is the neighborhood. And Long Island Sound is not affected by this, so you certainly can't measure that. And that's why this is unique, because this is an area in, a, in an A zone, not a B zone. And this is an area where when you place a fill, it affects no one else. So, Mr. Jackson, I, that didn't, everything you just said was consistent with things you'd already said, then none of that was, was, was specific to the issue that, that I, that I'm really trying to drill down on, which is, you know, and may, maybe the only part of it that really is different from everything, everything else that, that you've said in, in this, in the, in the, the safety floodplain development issue is that it's a redevelopment and there, there will be, in a sense, it's not true that no more people will be living in the coastal floodplain than are now, because right now the house is not occupied. And if this project goes forward, hopefully the house will be occupied with a nice family full of people who will then be a coastal floodplain. How much it higher? It will be at a safe elevation. How much higher is the home elevation than the current? Uh, proposed home elevation is three feet higher. The reason being three feet higher is because you need a, um, between any structural member, you need, uh, uh, Lenny, what is it? It's two feet of separation or is it, is it one foot of separation? Two feet of freeboard. Minimum requirement in New York State is two feet of freeboard above the base flood elevation. Uh, yeah. Federal requirement is less. Federal requirement means your, your, your lowest floor has to be at or above the base flood elevation. So you provided what to provide? How many feet? Three feet? Three feet. Do do we think it's a fair characterization to say that the septic is the only thing driving that fill? I think we should say that it's not, and I'll complete my point and you can respond to it, but then leave it aside too, which is that this is a holistic project where a number of things are happening, including the house being at a higher elevation. So how do you cherry pick where you're going to allocate the net fill? Um, and, and I'm happy to just move beyond it. I just don't know that on the record we should be accepting that. I mean, I, I could jump in on this. So I am, I am a certified floodplain manager. I'm also a member of the National Association. They keep pushing their net fill to the septic, but the septic the house is all one item. If they want to remove and have a zero net fill and take the argument away, they just raise the house. The house is 26, 26, 37 square feet. You raise it two feet, you, you got 10,000 cubic feet of space back. Their, their net fill is minus 6,000. I mean, they have a way to solve it. They just don't want to solve it. Yeah, and I, I, I don't, uh, I'll, I'll look to other commissioners. I don't need to go way down this but path. That doesn't work. That, that, that we should be pointing only to the septic for the net fill. It's a complete project with cut and with fill. Um, that's all. Could we ask uh, Mr. Hippolyte to repeat that? I didn't hear all of it. So the existing house is that grade, it's a slab on grade. The proposed house is a slab on grade with a little crawl space below it. I don't, have the, I don't have the plans for it, but they could put the house in the garage and everything up on stilts and have enough, just like you can see a, a normal coastal house and take away enough to make up 460 cubic yards. I think I don't have the architectural plan. Okay, but if you look at, yeah, but if you look at, okay, so we are taking credit for the, for the we have floodgates that are proposed within the crawl space so the water can come in and out of that area. So we can use that for compensatory storage. However, um, if we were to put the house on stilts, we still have the septic system. We wouldn't be able to, and we'd only be able to lower the area underneath that house to elevation nine or 10, which now you can't lower it any lower than that and still be able to have, have the water that flows in be able to get out. Yeah, I don't, I don't have I don't have the number. I'm just saying. I guess the question for you, Rich, is can you elevate the house, the garage, and anything else on site so it's above 
the flood elevation and get that storage back to make up the 460 cubic yards or 400. Yes. And now what we did is we do have that elevated and we do have floodgates within that foundation, but we can only lower that foundation, the, the, the slab in that foundation where we can take credit to. I mean, sure, we'll dig out an extra two feet, but then what's going to happen is the water is just going to get into that area and it's not going to be able to drain out. Well, it doesn't count then. It has to be able to drain out the counties. Exactly. So by raising our house up, we're really not getting anything. We're not increasing our flood storage. Am I correct or am I misunderstanding your statement? I don't, I don't, I don't have, like I said, I only have, I only have certain amount of plans. You have a patio back there, you have other stuff. I don't, I, I don't have your flood. I don't have your calculations for cubic yards in that bill. So I don't have, I don't have cross sections, I have nothing. I, I think you know, I understand that issue. Yeah, the question is, is can you redesign your site to your net fill zero? That's the question. And I think, I think what we've demonstrated over the last 15 months is the answer to that is no. And any any proposed use of this site, right? Even even just renovating or reusing the existing house, renovating the existing septic system, there's some level of fill that is required to do that. Yeah, and that's that's been clear. I, I just was reacting to. I, I don't think it's fair to say it's the septic. There's an, there's a whole plan here with a bunch of items that requires on the net basis four hundred mm -hmm. cubic yards of fill. I, I have a question that I, th that I think may be a council question. What, when, when the county determines that there's not an available sewer option, what standard do they apply? Uh, Jim or Rich, are you, are you familiar with the county's determination? I believe it would have to be a public sewer line. Yeah. yeah, yeah, reasonable okay. access to a public sewer. Okay, they, 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 don't, they don't determine the reasonableness of the private sewer option. No, I, I don't think that factored into it. Yeah. Okay. Okay, that answered my question. Thank you. And in the end, what I what I keep coming around to is this 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 inc what I find an incredibly thorny problem. How should we treat fill in the coastal floodplain? That I've I've made clear I find very troubling. Is not a problem if they avail themselves of private sewer option. And I've I've heard a lot of things that tell me that it is difficult for the applicant to do so, and they really don't want to. Um, I'm, I don't think that's the standard. I, I think what the, the real issue comes back to is the negative, the inconsistency with the LWRP policy that the fill would create. And I think what we're, dem what we've demonstrated effectively is the fill that's proposed, the 420 cubic yards, is consistent with all LWRP policies. And, and I hear your concern about policy 11, but I believe that we have effectively distinguished this piece of property. And everything is determined on a case by case basis, right? So, um, you know, my colleagues point earlier about decisions with, with precedent in mind versus making them on, on, on a detailed case specific. Um, circumstance is important here and it's important to remember that the fill is what's being proposed this is the project as proposed and there's there's nothing inconsistent uh, with any of the the 44 LWRP policies so when we talk about policy 11 it's a it, it's it's a redevelopment of the same density of development it's in an AE not a V what what else do you have Well, I, I mean, to Seamus's point earlier, it's also the, the overall project as a whole, right? So, so those are very distinguishing factors for this piece of property. Um, 
in, in connection with all of the other factors that we've demonstrated. So if you look at the project collectively, um, I, I think it's incredibly unique. I think we've demonstrated that this is something that is, is not easily uh, duplicated. And it's a, it's a very unique circumstance. It's a unique set of property, given all the studies that were done on flood volume storage impact. Um, the, the actual location and no impact to neighboring properties whatsoever, let alone an impact to human life or loss of property. Uh, and, that, and that's been effectively demonstrated. So is your, is your hesitation with, um, could it be supplemented with anything additional that, you're, that would make you feel more comfortable? Or is it just in general with, um, with the idea of potential precedent. Uh, as you, as you asked me that Ms. Motel, I, I found myself thinking, what would, what do I believe would, would close this question out? And I, I mean, I'm not, I'm not toying with you. I, I asked in earnest, what, what have you got that means that the, that the way that I should interpret 11 does not mean I have to say no to this project. And, I, I, and I'm thinking about two things that, that, that you've said or that Mr. Jackson has said. You, the, your team has said that it's an AE zone and not a V zone and that it's a redevelopment of the same level of development. I hear that. I like to have a record that I can put to bed and never think about again, and never think that I've made the wrong decision. Especially, there's only one policy that we can mess up so badly that we kill someone, right? That's policy 11. Everything else, if we ignore policy 25, we could end up losing something that's, that's culturally significant. But if we ignore policy 11 and forget that we're supposed to keep people out of harm's way in floodplains, that's the only thing we could do wrong that could actually result in a death. I do think there, I, I don't know exactly what it is, but I have an idea what it is. And I, I had not expected to say tonight this piece of information I didn't need, because this is probably the most complete record uh, in terms of the amount of paper and expert opinion thrown in it of, of any project that's come before this committee in my time. But, and I do find myself thinking, I, I want someone to give me a list that I can go to my grave saying was an adequate record that explains why it, you know, not the stuff about it's not gonna affect neighbor's properties. We've, we, I think I fully understand that issue now. But why, if, if we think of the function of the no net fill rule, as at least in part a prophylactic rule meant to prevent development in places where we would put people in danger, not, not on the neighbor's property, but in their own property by letting them put something up that puts them and their property in a flood. Why that's not an issue that should stop us from voting this consistent when generally we would vote a project consistent that ran afoul of that rule. What is it about this property that makes an exception to a, to a muscular, no net fill rule as a prophylactic appropriate? And I think I, I'm being as transparent as I can. I, I, every time I state a concern, it can be laid to rest either by a change in the project or by additional information. There's additional information that can, that can, that can allow me to lay my head down at night saying, you know what, I haven't poked in, I haven't made an intolerable exception to the way I view, and other commissioners might vote differently on or view this differently. I've made a stand that I think the no net fill rule is important. And I think I've made as clear an articulation on this project and particularly tonight as I ever have about why I feel the way I do about it. Now I want to know that I am not at odds with what I think I'm supposed to vote for if I vote consistent on this project, because this project is in fact a safe development where it is in the floodplain it is, even if others might not be. 
Right. So, so this project does fully comply with the floodplain development standards and FEMA's floodplain development standards, and the home is above the flood, the base flood elevation, right? So this project isn't proposing to put people in harm's way. Thinking of, uh, I, I got that. I, okay. I got that. We have a different, we have a different set of standards for, for floods and the way we interpret policy 11 doesn't have to be and is not, in fact, the same, right? We have, we have localized problems and different problems, and we have people that periodically have to be rescued from the Avalon by boat because we have different problems than other municipalities in, in the state or in the country, okay? I, the, you asked me a while ago if there was another piece of information I could get, and I was in, in a very long form, I think I just answered your question. I don't know exactly what it is, but I, I know what it looks like. It's something that tells me that you know, this development here does not raise the kind of development issues that I think we have to serve by interpreting no net fill as a rule of prophylaxis against dangerous floodplain development. I, I think I don't think I I'm you know, I'm, I'm in weir mode trying to trying to articulate a standard there. I've said that as clearly as I can. Thinking of um, a tragic example that we actually had in the village of Mamaronik, um, does uh, current status of, I guess, elevation of the home versus the what's proposed, is it right to understand that if an emergency vehicle needed to get down during a flood down Grecian Point Road to this house, it now has three feet higher of buffer where people may not have evacuated and would be there? Uh, above when, you know, like an emergency vehicle would be able to get down the road? Has anyone thought about that? The road is above the 100-year floodplain. The road is about elevation 11, I believe, or 12. Actually, it's at 12 at the front of the property. So if there is a 100-year flood, uh, uh, flood uh, the residents of the home do need to be rescued. That it should, I believe, it should all be dry as long as it's less than that, that uh, it's the hundred year the hundred year floodplain is 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 thir is uh, thirteen. So we're above that. So this is probably this road. It sounds like is higher than Cove Road or over by Hampshire Country Club. Some of those you know access points to that those neighborhoods. It's yes. not the same problem. There there are definitely places where the road access is the problem, and that I I'm I'm not sure because we haven't spent a lot of time with it. But it doesn't sound to me like that's the problem here. I, so, Ms. Motel, you asked me if there was something that, that would that that would resolve this concern in my mind, and I and I and I think I'm thinking that yes, there there would be. But I, I in the past, our, um, our the the two respective consultants who have addressed um, coastal flooding issues have have uh, directed their written opinions to. Harm to neighboring properties, uh, change to flood elevation based on the, the lost mass and stuff. Uh, maybe because our our discussion hadn't been as specifically focused on this issue. I don't think we have a complete record on this issue, uh, and I think we could. Um, so I, I think there's I think there's your answer. So, Chairman, let, let me let me ask you this: If we if we provide you with a response in writing that contemplates what we discussed tonight and addresses specifically this policy 11, this particular issue that you feel like you need more information on, um, could we ask that a draft resolution be prepared, uh, that, that the commission uh, you know, direct council to prepare a draft resolution for the next meeting? I, you know, I thought it would, I thought we would have been to a vote already. I, uh, I absolutely anticipate that uh, we are ready to vote this. We have exhausted every concern I know I had and some that I found I hadn't fully articulated. Um, I, and I hesitate to speak for my fellow commissioners, but on, on this one, I think I could speak for my fellow commissioners. We've had a lot of time with this. We've had a lot of time to develop the every specific area we had concerns about. I don't think we've got open stuff hanging out there. And I know for myself, I'm, I'm down to this one issue. 
Um, is there anything else that, because I'm expecting a resolution and a vote next time, is there anything else that any other commissioner thinks that we need in order to know uh, how to cast our vote for this application? All right, so I'm, I'm, I'm hearing nothing. I, yeah, I, what? What's what's the so what's the I mean I have a preference potentially to vote sooner I mean it's all very fresh we just had a lot of discussion right here what what's the proposed path um, what's the what's the, what's the plan well I what I'm proposing uh, look I'm not going to overrule my fellow commissioners and if 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 four people want to vote tonight we'll vote tonight but. Um, but I, th I think the plan is, I think Ms. Motel thinks she can supply another, uh, an, an opinion that's more specific to the, to the safety oriented analysis of no net fill that uh, we've been talking about for the much of the back half of tonight's discussion and that we'll have a resolution ready to go and that people have, have considered everything. And once we see that, we'll know everything we need to know and we'll be done. Um, so I think that's the plan. But if, if my fellow commissioners are thinking that, you know, I'm welcome to cast my vote however I want, but they know everything they need to know tonight, uh, I'm not going to, I'm not going to procedurally impose uh, a delay on anybody else. And so the resolution would list basically you know, all the, all the documents, all the record, the, the meetings, and leave a placeholder if we have any kind of, um, uh conditions discussion at that point that's and then we that and that's that's the concept yeah we've historically voted on on completely prepared resolutions and we've been uh it, it, we've 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 allowed we've slid on that a little bit for applications that have have not uh produced as many media issues to talk about but it it is it is really the better practice and we actually don't have a resolution ready tonight yeah, I'm 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 okay with that. Um, I I I I think I'll just say what I, quickly what I'm going to say. I mean, I I think that we're consider. I'm considering um, policy seven seven a 11, 12, 14, 33, 37, probably always forty four. So I don't want to somehow give the impression that we're narrowed down to you know, closing off a, a policy 11 item, but um, I'm, I'm never going to stand in front of a better safety um, um, proposal from a fellow commissioner. So that hey, I, mean, I don't expect anybody to, to, to prejudge their own vote. I try as, as just as a best practice, never to tell people, you know, what I'm going to vote only whether my you know, I feel like my concerns have been resolved. I, there are a number of issues I came in to this application and to this evening thinking about. Um, concerns get resolved one by one. And I, the thing that I know that I'm not sure I know enough on is the one we've just been talking about. Okay, I, uh, with, with no strong opposition, I, I, think, I think that is the plan. I think we will, uh, we will see this applicant one more time on this. Okay, so we will submit a very clear list per your direction, Chairman, and return to you in July for a vote on a resolution um, that council prepares between now and that meeting. And Ms. Motel, you're, you're a good lawyer. You see, you see this issue. You, you see what I'm talking about. The, this, the, the function of, there, there, are multiple, there may be multiple reasons in the legislative history for the no net fill rule, right? But for, for our purposes, the interplay with, with, of the no net fill rule with 11 and safety is, my, is the concern of mine that I don't feel we have a full record on. You know, not, not other reasons we like the project. The con, what it is that allows me to review the interplay of no net fill as a prophylactic rule and policy 11 that allows me to say this one is okay, even though there, even though generally, we apply no net fill as a prophylactic against danger in floodplains. That's my concern. Okay, understood. 
Um, if there's nothing else, I, I just want to really thank the commission for their time tonight and um, for the thoroughness of review that they're that they're giving this this project and this application. Okay, it has been a very long night and fortunately everything else we needed to do on this agenda is uh, complete. I will uh, say good evening to the applicant team. So Thomas, Thanks we do time. have um, some people with in attendees who have their hand raised for public comment. Oh, we, we have, if we have ever done public comment on this, we have not done it in a very long time. Um, and as long as we've got people waiting, we should not, um, we should do that while we can. Uh, in that case, I'm going to open public comment while we're all still here. If you could please identify yourself for the record, please. Did he not? Oh. I think you have to unmute. Good evening, Mr. T. Kurt. You've got, you're still on mute. Good evening. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear yes. you. Yes. Um, I had some comments about the stormwater um, plan as proposed and as discussed earlier. Um, I got a few comments at the beginning here. I understood Mr. Kellard to both say that Mr. Garcia had reviewed the plan, um, not himself, but also that he believed the plan met the requirements of the stormwater design manual in chapter 294. Am I unconfused about what was said or can you clarify that? Uh, Mr. Garcia, uh, Garcia, who did the full review on the project, clearly stated to me that it's in compliance with New York State guidelines for stormwater and the Romernic uh, Stormwater Code. So you're not saying that, he, but he said that to you. That's why. Yes. Um, is the board aware that the last new house built on Grecian Point either elected or was required to put in a force main? The house at 1209 Grecian Point, about four properties past this house. Sorry, I didn't I didn't catch was forced to install what? Uh, uh, in the in the aughts, the last new house that was built on Grecian Point at 1209 Grecian Point put in a forced main. Whether they were required to or elected to, I'm not sure. But I would think as just kind of out of fairness, if they were required to, the board may want to consider that. That's useful information. Thank you. The applicant at the beginning said the village consulting engineer approved the stormwater plan. Village consulting engineer does not approve the stormwater plan. That's approved by the planning board, as far as I know. Um, so I've written a couple things to the board about this. The last thing was February 3rd, 2021, where I stated that I thought there were some deficiencies with the plan and I don't see that they've been addressed and I just wanted to ask them in this public forum. Um, I'll, I'll take a moment to respond. I, I we had received a letter from you guys or I think our entire commission had um, pointing to the use of cisterns and questions around water quality practice and I asked Mr. Keller explicitly about that um, we had a discussion about the fact that these aren't really cisterns in their current use and that the stormwater plan met you know, all the requirements. So it certainly wasn't ignored, uh, is what I can say. Okay. I was just raising it because I want to go through those points again. Um, I 
in the letter i cited education law that requires that no official this is a quote from section 7209 um, of new york state education law no official of this state or any other city county town or village therein charged with the enforcement of laws ordinances or regulations shall accept or approve any plans specifications or geological drawings or reports that are not stamped stamped refers to the stamp of the licensed professional that presented them plans before you have no stamp on them the memo I, I, wa I want to uh, note one thing. I took a look at the uh, the uh, plans that were put before the County Board of Health that were um, that were uh, included in the June four submission to us, and th and those plans were were signed and sealed. Well, clearly the county required them to be, but your plans for stormwater management are unsealed. I believe if you look at them. And those are the plans you're reviewing. Department of Health reviewed the septic system. Um, I think that's a significant issue. I don't think this board should be reviewing plans that don't have the seal of a professional engineer. I, I just think it's not a good practice. The second point I made was neither the SWIP nor the submitted plans refer to any structural stormwater management practices accepted by the stormwater design manual, which is the document that chapter 294. There was a lot of talk tonight. I believe it was pretty readily admitted they're not doing um, infiltration and I'm not sure if it was said in so many words, but clearly not doing water quality. Pre-treatment is not water quality. Pre-treatment is pre-treatment. It happens before the water quality. It's pre. The first paragraph of chapter six, stormwater design manual, performance criteria says, this chapter outlines performance criteria for five groups of structural stormwater management practices to meet water quality treatment goals. These include ponds, wetlands, infiltration, I'm sorry, infiltration practices, filtering systems, and open channels. Um, this system does, I mean, if one of the engineers wants to state which of those um, accepted practices are being used for water quality on the site, I'd be interested to know. There are none. That's why there's no infiltration testing in the stormwater management um, in the SWIP. There's no infiltration. They're running it into two sealed tanks and out through a pipe into the wetlands. That's the stormwater management practice here. It's pretty clear. There is no water quality being performed on the runoff. Um, I want to make one other point. There seems to be a trend to submitting stormwater management practice information to boards in the rather disjointed way it was presented here. Up until a few years ago, generally on an application, there would be a plan set that would be just it would be labeled stormwater management. Plans before you, you have 
the stormwater management practices on one sheet, you have the elevations on another sheet. So you have to flip back between sheets. Um, there are immense, I believe, minor deficiencies that don't meet the requirements, but you have major deficiencies here. There is no water quality being done there. Unless your licensed professional consultant are gonna put their seal on a report to you as section 7209 says is required or reports that are not stamped, you shouldn't accept it. Let him put his seal and say this complies with chapter 294 and the stormwater design manual by extension. So that's all I have to say on that. I'm happy to answer any questions about what I've said. But the other, I'm sorry, one more thing. Chapter 294, 8B3J says that the SWIP shall be prepared by a New York State licensed professional engineer, certified professional in erosion and sediment control, or licensed landscape architect, and must be signed by the professional preparing the plan, who shall certify that the design of all stormwater management practices meets the requirements of this chapter. So you should require that too, I believe. I believe requiring both these things would solve a lot of problems with applications like this taking 16 months. You'd get much more complete, honest applications. Thank you, I hope you get out of here soon. Thanks very much for your comments and for your continued close concern to land use issues in the village, Stuart. Uh, do we have other members of the public? We do not have anyone who wishes to speak. Okay. All right, so the public hearing is closed. Uh, and uh, in, in response to those comments, I, I, I can't imagine that it's a problem to have uh, to, mm -hmm. to substitute a, a a sealed set of plans. Yeah, um, Mr. Chairman, I, I believe everything was stamped and signed as appropriate, but I'll verify that too. And if not, um, I've actually closed sure that screen so I can't go check. Uh, I think we'll all okay. look. And if, but if, yeah. if there's not a stamped and uh, if there's what not a, a stamp, we'll, we'll make sure you have what you need, Mr. Chairman. We, we, we stamped and sealed hard copies. However, we also provided the electronic copies to the village, which were uploaded. And those, uh -huh, as those you can are. understand, are generally stamped and signed. Okay, that 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 would make some sense of that. Um, okay, thank you. And uh, what what about? Uh, there's just one thing I didn't follow when there was silence. Is, is, uh, I'm just not, not qualified here. Is the is the water quality you know point and uh, how it's effectuated? Is, is there something that's not compliant with um, requirements about this plan? I don't believe that's the case. And John, you can comp, uh, comment on that too. I don't believe it's the case either. I, I'm not the one who performed the review on the project. So I really can't respond on the details of it, but I can follow up with Esteban who, did, who performed the review, but he specifically told me it was in compliance. Yeah, it might be, I, um, the engineers probably heard this correctly, so maybe you guys can help to formulate it. Was there a list and you have to use one of them and no one was able to say which one well, we're using or am I not following that correctly? We, we, do, we do use it. We do use, we do use um, the rainwater harvesting tanks do provide water quality because what they do is it, 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 it's a settlement system. It's not necessarily 100% of a pretreatment and it is an accepted practice. Uh, what we're doing is we're taking and we're using this water to to irrigate the plants and everything else and any solids and such are going to be lowered to, to the bottom of the tank. Yes, there is going to have to be some type of 
a maintenance on the tank, but that's a standard and there's a stormwater agreement that gets filed with the village upon the completion of every project to make sure that the applicant follows through with that anyway. With any project, with any project, there's a stormwater maintenance. Agreement. Well, we are in compliance and is standard. there are standard practices being used. So, uh, but we'll, we'll send you a note in writing on this confirming all that. Yeah, that'd be, that'd be helpful just to tell you from my layman's perspective. It sounds like there's a list of things that should be used yes. and no one responded to which one we're using. So that right. just closing that off would be really helpful. That, that's fine. We'll, we'll take care of that for you. Thank you. Okay. Well, that's a, that's a concise, discrete issue. And I'm, and I'm sure Mr. Keller will have uh, the opportunity to take a look at whatever submitted before we, um, before we next look at this file. Uh, as, uh, okay. I, I think we have, we have done everything we are going to do on this tonight. It, we have completed our public hearing. We've, uh, we've had an extensive discussion with the applicant. Our, our to-do list is uh, one thing for the engineers, one thing for council. Uh, and uh, I think with that, we can all go to bed. Uh, I'm going to bid the applicants team a good evening. Good evening. Thank you Thank to the board. You. Okay. And <clears throat> and then I'm going to uh, make a motion to adjourn. All in favor? Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Um, <laughs> uh, just, just, sorry, just the last thing, and I'm not going to keep us, but we, we should try to have all of the things that uh, we talked about today by our work section. Do you agree with that? It would be really advantageous because we, we have got to get our, uh, we've got to get our um, resolutions drafted before we, before we have to cast votes on them. So, and, and, <laughs> And with that, if I'm not, if, it, if we're not too fussy, I can say hi, and I think that covers us. But um, yeah, yeah, we're we're adjourned. Thank you for a whole lot of your time and a whole lot of your attention. Thank you, folks. Thanks. Thanks.